Welcome everybody to a brand new Blu-ray and DVD out and about video today and this week sees the fifth film in the Purge franchise The Forever Purge Hitting store shelves along with Paramount Pictures is releasing a Blu-ray edition of the 1985 whodunit comedy Clue and Arrow Video is releasing a 4K special edition of the 1984 horror classic Children of the Corn plus much, much more. So let's go see the deals, exclusives, and we are our first location, Walmart. So let's go in and see what they got. All right, we are in at Walmart, stocked up and ready to go, baby. Look at this. Oh, they did a great job, man. It is stocked. Oh, man, why can't every week be like this? But the fact that there's barely any empty holes in this, that is amazing. And even some new release love. Oh, be still my heart. <laughs> oh, wow, three weeks in a row. Walmart has put out the goodies. Man, they are catching one hell of a fever. And I'm liking it, baby. Indeed I am, man. Let's dive in, shall we? With the first how I'm seeing, and that is none other than The Forever Purge. The 4K Blu-ray Digital for $27.96. The Blu-ray DVD Digital for $22.96. And the DVD for $17.96 with, oh, another slip, man. I'm loving the DVDs getting a slip now, man. It's really cool. It's just cool for the collector market, man. People who love slip covers but only get DVDs, it's really cool for them as, as well, man. Everybody gets a slip cover. You get a slip cover. You get a slip cover. You get a slip cover. Everybody loves them slip covers, baby. Awesome, awesome indeed. Loving that. Now... I got a chance to watch this in the movie theater with John. We wanted to watch it, especially John, because he really loved the trailer, and we decided, you know what, we're going to give this thing a look and see how it is. I've seen all the Purge movies. Purge, Purge Anarchy, Purge Election Year, the first Purge, I have seen them all, man, and for good or bad, they are what they are, man. Some are better than others, let's be real, but it's an interesting idea, an interesting premise, but after Purge Election Year, I thought we were never going to get any more of them. Then the first Purge happened, and I was like, okay, I kind of understand seeing the first Purge, seeing how it was set up, okay, that makes sense to, to me. But anything after that, I thought, okay, we're really not going to get anything. This series is done. Well, money talks, bullshit walks, never say never, because here we are with the Forever Purge, man. If they can make more Purge m movies, come up with some insane wild concept, they will definitely do it, man. And here we are yet again. So basically what this movie is, a new government has come in. And they have reinstated the purge, and everybody's back to fearing for their lives and surviving that one night a year. And they go through the purge. They go through the night. Yes, there's casualties, but nothing really crazy major. And it's done. It's over with, right? Wait until another year for yet another purge. Well, wait just a second there, guys, because... These people, these maniacs, these crazies out there, oh, they're not done yet. They want a forever purge, and they are going to make it last for as long as they possibly can. Chaos reigns, and trying to stop these people is easier said than done, man. They just don't want one night. They want every night, and God help anyone who gets in their way. Oh, baby, talk about the purgiest of purge movies, man. <laughs> this is one of them. Okay, so I'm going to be real with, with you, man. At this point, I don't know whether I'm kind of over the Purge movies exactly, but you know what you're getting with the Purge films. And this one is the same thing that you've gotten over and over again. Obviously, the killings, the people in the masks, the brutal slayings, the weaponry, you name it, it's all, all there, man. But what I like about this one is they definitely, I mean, the Purge movies have always, to one extent or another, been political. 
right? They, they've always had a political bent to them in some way or another. They really have. And this one, I think, is really that way, probably more than any of the other ones. Because I got to admit, guys, this movie really scared me. Now, did it scare me because it was like a great horror experience? You know, like scary moments? No, not exactly. Was it scary because of the crazy wild kills? No, even though there is some cool kills here, it's not as good as some of the other Persian movies. Why did it scare me exactly? Because it felt real to me. It really did. And it was terrifying how realistic this movie felt. Because I don't want to get too over political with you guys, but we're dealing with something now where you have a lot of these extremists who want to cause chaos for the sake of causing chaos. And they, they believe these insane theories and these insane ideas, and they will go out of their way to do anything and everything to disrupt the system. And honestly, when I saw this movie, I was like, oh my God, this can really happen. This is real. It tried to happen this year it they tried to do this this was almost a real thing so watching this movie i was like my god man if there was any movie that is so realistic it to today's society it's the forever purge man it, it really is it struck a chord with me in a big bad way it really did i mean yes it's over the top yes it's ridiculous Obviously, the kills and the personalities and everything, yes, but it's so real with so many aspects of it. The idea of people who believe this country is just white and founded on white nationalism and that's it, and that any foreigners in this country need to go, get out, or be killed. It's scary to think that this is real life, but it really is, and it just terrifies the living hell out of me. It really does, man. And it's movies like this that are a stark reminder of that in a, in a huge way. I appreciated what they were trying to do, and I think they were kind of successful for the most part. I think there's better killings in other Persian movies. I think there's better masks and better chaos in other films like The Purge Anarchy, which I think is... Probably, if I had to say, is probably the best Purge of all time. It is. I think this movie is better than the first Purge, is better than that first movie, The Purge. But I don't think it holds a candle to anarchy, and I don't think it holds a candle to election year. But I still think it's a solid horror experience. If you're looking for torturing and killing and, and, and good old sort of you know, torture porn goodness, I guess, then this movie is right up your alley. It's all been there, done that, but I just really like the messaging in this movie. And for that reason alone, I think this movie really is a great shining example of what you can really do with horror movies. You can really put a spotlight on messaging or certain political issues when you can do it right. And I think the Forever Purge definitely does that, man. It's eye-opening, and you just sit there like, my God, they literally ripped this movie out of headlines and just made it a little more extreme, but it ain't that far off, man. It really isn't. And as a Jewish man, as somebody whose family was immigrants coming to this country... I see movies like this, and it's a stark reminder that there's a lot of people out there that don't want foreigners around, and they will do anything to get their way. And damn, the extreme that they will go to, and this movie is a shocking reminder of that. It truly is, man. Not the greatest Purge movie ever, not really the greatest horror torture movie ever, but really interesting messaging wrapped around an interesting story, and when you can do an effective Purge movie, it can work well, and I think this one does. Even though it's a little long in the tooth now, the series, and it's losing its effectiveness, it does have moments where it still truly works, and The Forever Purge has moments like that, man. Really, really solid flick. 
for what it is. For the fifth entry, some people just sort of cash in. I don't think this is a cash in type of horror flick for a fifth one in a franchise. But that being said, I've seen better, but I've seen worse. And I gotta say, The Forever Purge definitely hits home in some major ways, man. Really does. Shocking, but totally well worth the journey. That is for sure, man. And the cover to this, the cover is amazing. I love that with the the horse and the red, white, and blue, man. And the guy with the, with the hatchet. And that's just a great image. A really fantastic image of just how how twisted people can become and how the world can become such a really really fantastic image that really just sums up the purge movies in general so fantastic love the shit out of that man man i really hope i don't live to see a purge because man i'm locking my doors i'm i'm sitting at home watching movies and probably having a shotgun in my lap just in case no one's taking my life and no one's taking my goddamn movies. And if they do, I'm purging their ass. Family. <laughs> oh, goddamn you, Vin. Oh, Lord, yes. Of course, we had all the Fast 9 love last week, but they did not have this. The only at Walmart exclusive 9 movie collection for $44.96. My God, man. 9 movies of Fast and Furious. You guys know my whole rant that I had on Fast 9, okay? You get it. You you know. There are moments where I criticize box sets, right? I do all the time because I'm like, well, they're incomplete and you want to wait until a complete set really comes out of all the movies for you to enjoy them all instead of buying a box set and then new movies come out and you got to rebuy the damn thing. But when it comes to Fast and Furious... There is an exception to this. There, There is, guys. There really is an exception because I'm not going to lie. I don't really think Fast 9 is worth it to have in the collection. I mean, if you are a diehard, hardcore Fast and Furious fan, sure, why not? <sighs> Whatever. I mean, to me, the series ended after 7. It really did. Once Paul Walker died and that really great send-off of his character and the end of that movie, I just really felt that there was nothing really left for the series to say at that point, and it just has been overextending itself since. I just don't really feel the need to want 8 or 9, even if 10 and 11 is really good. I just think that they've just become a pale comparison and a parody of themselves, and I just don't know where they're going with 10 and 11. I don't know how they're going to wrap this up in a really satisfying way. And I think that's the problem that I have with this, guys. That's the big problem that I have because there's so many really great opportunities that they've had that they've just crapped on. I mean, Vin Diesel still has a beef with Dwayne The Rock Johnson. He's not coming back for 10 or 11. He's already said that he's not coming back to this. So such a great pivotal character from movie five on is just gone and is never going to be back again that sucks man so you've already lost one of the pivotal characters that you're never going to see again there's characters that have come back from the dead for no apparent reason i mean there is things here that just make no goddamn sense they had an opportunity to end this they had an opportunity to walk away and i think have a lot of respect from fans and movie lovers alike and we could have always speculated, oh, what if they had done a part eight and a part nine and gone into space and everything like that, right? We could have always speculated about it, but I would have rather done that than see where they went. Because seeing where they went after Paul Walker's death, the franchise has really lost its way, man. So, yeah, I'll watch 10 and 11. Sure, I'll be into the whole family thing. I'll, I'll Sure, why not? But... Do I still get the same feels from this franchise that I did, you know, many years ago? No, and I think for most people, they're just trading off the nostalgia at this point. I mean, great cover. I love the shit out of that cover with Dom and the cross and everything. That's really cool. But as cool of a cover as it is, it's not going to make me want to buy it. Put it that way, man. Uh, it's not. Damn shame, too, man. Because, again used to love the shit out of this and it's slowly but surely been rotting away ever since Paul Walt Walker's death and 
God knows where it's going to end up, but I don't really look forward to the results, guys. I don't know about you, man. Ah, man, interesting to say the least. Interesting indeed, man. The more I have to see of Vin Diesel's bald head. (laughs) Oh, Well, it's either seeing Vin Diesel's bald head or him having a toupee in that really terrible film. Ah, shit, I'll just take the bald head. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Why not, man? Oh, I miss the days of Paul Walker. I really do. Oh, man, look. I mean, they had new release love. All of the shelves are stocked. They still even have that really great 4K bl- Blu-ray cover of Cruella. And I didn't really even know this was in a Walmart exclusive at the time, but that is such a great exclusive. I mean, that's a regular 4K, which is cool, but I think this cover is even better, man. God, they've got all of the stuff. They've even got the Boss Baby exclusive here as well. I mean, they have it fully stocked with new release love. Man, Walmart is getting better, and I'm loving the hell out of it. God, wish they would do this all the time. Man, if only. Let's head out. Three weeks in a row? Damn, who'd have thunk that? (laughs) Who would indeed, man? Not so bad after all, baby, dare I say. I mean, yes, they only had the one new release love this week, but they did have the big new release, plus the shelves are stacked with all the physical media love. You got to at least appreciate that, man. That's pretty damn sweet. The fact that they're actually putting out the stuff now, oh, makes me a very happy physical media boy. That is for damn sure, man. Oh, it really, really does. I am very happy to see them kind of sort of getting a little bit back on track especially now in the fall that we're heading towards the end of the year black friday big sales so it's good to see them getting back into the physical media swing of things you know what i mean man not bad after all seeing that fast and furious walmart exclusive is pretty cool as well so there was a couple things to see nothing major but not exactly the most hugest physical media week ever either so uh, You take what you can get. You know what I mean, guys? But still, pretty damn cool to see Walmart being back in the game, man. Not bad at all. Hope you enjoyed it. Let's see some more physical media love ahead. All right, everybody. We are at our second location, Target. But before I go in, I got to talk to you guys about something. So, Dune is out very, very soon, and Denny Villeneuve is out there doing the rounds for Dune, you know, talking about the movie, about directing it, potential part two, you name it. And what's interesting is that he had some comments about other films out there, perhaps the Marvel films, yes. Seems like everybody has an opinion on the Marvel films, and now Denny Villeneuve is having one as well. Now, he was doing this interview, and he says that Marvel movies are cut and paste of other films. He goes on to say there are too many Marvel movies that are nothing more than a cut and paste of others. Uh, Doing a little Marvel criticism, shall we say? Yeah, perhaps just a little bit, guys. Look, let me be real with you. Now, Denny Villeneuve is not the first, nor will he ever be the last to be criticizing Marvel. Of course, you know the very first one, the more famous one, and that is none other than Martin Scorsese, baby. Yes, Martin Scorsese, of course, went out of his way to criticize Marvel movies and got a lot of praise and a lot of pushback. Now, I don't think that this quote, people are really going out of their way to make a huge deal out of it like they did the Martin Scorsese one. I think the Martin Scorsese one was a little bit more of a hot take than this one, exactly. But a lot of people had complained with Martin Scorsese. They said, well, he's he's old. He's, you know, he's senile now. And, you know, movies aren't the way they were back in the day. And he's just being grumpy. Mean old man. (laughs) And, and... Now that Denny Villeneuve is doing it, it's kind of interesting because Denny Villeneuve is not exactly, you know, an old man. He's very much in his prime as a director and somebody that is making very popular movies now, very artistic movies. So him saying it brings a whole different aspect to it. But is he right? Denny Villeneuve can say whatever he wants to say. Everybody is afforded an opinion. 
and that's a fact, okay? But at the same time, I don't know if I 100% agree with his statement. I think he's saying the Marvel movies are very cut and paste because they're the most popular thing out there. And I think a lot of filmmakers really push back on the idea of comic book and superhero hero movies because they feel like they're just very generic. They're not entirely wrong on that, but these movies have been going on for decades and generations. It's not like the past 10, 15 years, it just came into existence. It's been around for a long, long time. Now, it's never been as popular as it has been nowadays, and so I can see the pushback of like, well, they're not as artistic, and they're, they're popcorn flicks, and... You know, it's just, oh, taking this idea and cutting, pacing it on this other movie, sure, okay, you're right to a certain extent. However, there's a lot of movies out there that are just cut and paste. I've seen so many horror movies, romance movies, action movies that are literally copycats of other films, better films. Does that mean that they just don't do it? No, they want to try to maybe do it better or different or put their own spin on it. Who's to say that they're wrong in doing that? Who's to say that they couldn't or shouldn't do that? Look, the problem with Hollywood nowadays is there's not a lot of originality anymore. It's the truth. There's not a lot anymore. And when there is... We're always comparing it to something else, aren't we? I mean, we really are. As movie lovers and people who have seen a lot of movies, we're always contrasting and comparing. That's what we do, man. Even Denny Villeneuve, I would complain, he's doing Dune. Well, isn't he sort of in some ways copying and pasting from the David Lynch version? Maybe even just a little bit? Possibly. But, again... I won't criticize, <laughs> but you can make the argument, as you can make the argument for many, many other films out there. There are so many films that are like, oh, yeah, this sequence is right from Death Wish, or, oh, this sequence is clearly from Star Wars. I mean, it's been done to death time and time again. But I think with Marvel and the success of Marvel, I think it brings out a lot of haters. And that's the true truth of it, man. I mean, anybody's success always ends up breeding some sort of hate one way or another. And I feel like some of it is warranted. And other points, I feel like maybe they go too far with it. I don't think Denny Villeneuve's comments really take away from Marvel at all. I understand where he's coming from. But I feel like a lot of filmmakers like a Denny Villeneuve or a Martin Scorsese, a lot of these people, I think they are looking for more creative avenues than just a superhero film for superhero film's sake, right? I think they're looking for something that has more substance, something that has, you know, more artistic value. But then again, you can argue that the Marvel movies can and do at times have artistic value. And there's more really unique and interesting filmmakers that are coming to the table, like with the Eternals. That director had just won an Oscar, so she could do whatever the hell she wants. She decided to do a Marvel movie. Who's to say that she's wrong? She could have a really great artistic spin on it that is quite original and unique. Just because it's superhero and comic book movies doesn't mean that we should just throw them under the table, and forget about them as just popcorn art fair. Any movie at the end of the day can be popcorn art fair. I mean, that's the honest-to-God truth. It just depends on how it's made and how it comes across. Look, I love Denny Villeneuve, and these comments don't, you know, make me not like him anymore or anything. I think he's an amazing filmmaker, a great artistic style. But before we criticize you know, one group of films or one franchise, maybe we should look at the whole thing in general and say that, yes, there is a lot of cut and paste quality to Marvel movies, but then again, there's a lot of cut and paste to everything. Hollywood is no longer really original, and nowadays somebody is always copying off of somebody else's work. Hate to say it, but, but um, well, it really is the truth, man. It's 
honestly is not much originality anymore. And when there is, like, five years' time, everybody's already copied the damn thing. Remember The Matrix with the whole, like, bullet time shit? In, like, five or ten years' time, that shit was already played out, man. I mean, hell, it was probably played out, like, two or three years afterwards. Everybody was aping off that shit. So, again... You do something original, and then everybody's going to want to do it in their own unique way. Maybe not as good, but, well, everybody has the right to try, don't they? It's kind of curious, man. I'm kind of curious as to what your thoughts are on that. I really do. Like I said, they have a certain, a certain point to it, but at the same time, hmm, is it really right to criticize them and not criticize others? kind of curious what you guys think definitely let me know in the meantime it's not a crazy busy plentiful week for physical media but there is a thing or two to show off so what will target have let's go in and find out all right everybody we are in at target and look more new release love target done did it again baby indeed they did <sighs> They've been impressing as of late. What can I say, man? Every single time you come in, you find some new release love. And I am digging the hell out of that, baby. Let's dive in, shall we? With the first title that I'm seeing, they have the 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray Digital of The Forever Purge. For, well, there is no price for that. I'm assuming it's got to be like $29.99 or something like that. I mean, they do have that. They have the Blu-ray DVD Digital for $24.99 and the DVD for, well, they don't have a price here either. I'm assuming it's like $19.99 or some shit like that. Prob probably. I mean, you know, you know how DVDs are, man. So they have that Blu-ray and the 4K. So they have all the Forever Purge love indeed, man. Now... The fifth film in a franchise, number five, man. And it's kind of interesting when you think of horror franchises, especially number five, because horror franchises by the fifth entry mostly are kind of watered down at this point. Most franchises usually are. That's pretty much the general consensus. I mean, there is some exceptions, I happen to really enjoy Friday the 13th Part 5. I mean, yes, I know, spoiler alert, it's not really Jason, but I just thought that movie is one wacky-ass film, dude. I really did. That film, my God, man, that, that is that is a weird Friday the 13th flick, man, but really, really enjoyable. And I like the whole idea of Roy and him impersonating Jason. It was kind of cool for what it was, man, to be fair. I also do enjoy The Dream Child. I know it's not everyone's favorite of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, and I know it's kind of cheesy, and the kills are not really all that great, but I kind of like the battle that he has with Alice, and I like the pregnancy angle and how he's trying to get to the baby and be reborn. I I kind of dig that shit, okay? I, I do. It's a guilty pleasure. What can I tell you, man? Halloween 5... Yeah, no. Nah. See, I'm not a big fan of Halloween 5. Man, the mask is so fucked up in that movie, man. And it's such a pale comparison to the other Halloween movies. I mean, I like the idea of little Jamie coming back and resolving that whole stuff. But it's just a weird movie, man. I mean, the idea of Michael Myers being taken care of by this, this homeless hobo... <laughs> And then just waiting an entire year and then, wait a minute, it's Halloween? I think I have to get up and do my job now. <laughs> it's like, what the hell? Yeah, not exactly the best one in the franchise, man. I mean, even Child's Play. I mean, I really do love most of the Child's Play movies, but Seed of Chucky... Ah, uh, I like moments in Seed of Chucky, but it is so off-kilter of a Chucky film, man. It's got moments, but I don't know. Even in lesser franchises, like, I will say with the Hellraiser franchise, I mean, the franchise technically went to shit after, well, in my opinion, part two, but if you say part three, I don't blame you. But the fifth one actually is not bad. I believe it's Hellraiser Inferno, and with Craig Schaefer and him playing the corrupt detective, that's a pretty cool one, man. That's not a bad straight-to 
physical media horror flick, especially for a franchise. I mean, by this point, most of them are absolute shit, so I actually kind of dig part five of Hellraiser. And there's so many uh, other ones. I mean, even something like Phantasm. Phantasm Ravager is not really all that good, man. I mean, it's a pale comparison to the other Phantasm movies, in my opinion. It's so CGI heavy, and it doesn't really have the same spirit of the other Phantasm films. And there's so many more examples out there. It's so fascinating because if you look at the fifth film in most of these horror franchises, it's not like they're really blowing the roof off the doors exactly. It's not really happening. Because by the time you get to a fifth film in a franchise, most of it, all the good shit has already been taken up. And basically you're just spinning your wheels at this point. Not saying you can't make something good, but it's a pretty god damn big rarity i'm just saying it really is man so i gotta give the forever purge at least a little bit of credit and i do because it's not incredibly watered down it's not a real big pale comparison to the other purge movies i mean it's not the best purge movie but it's not exactly the worst purge movie by any stretch of the imagination either i mean yeah i would have wanted more crazy kills and more crazy over the top blood and gore you do get a decent amount but not nearly the amount that you got with the second purge film or even the third one you kind of lack it in that department, but the messaging, though, I really do appreciate. I really did appreciate on this film. I thought the costumes were pretty cool, and I like the idea of expanding the Purge to be more of complete and utter chaos. Because what I've appreciated about them is just how much of controlled chaos they have. It's one night, you survive 12 hours your home free and you gotta wait another year and you know ammo guns shelter you name it with something like the forever purge it's just completely ongoing your survivability is so fucked <laughs> like i'm serious man like your survivability rate just went from like maybe 50 to 60 percent to damn near five to ten percent like my god man i mean they're everywhere and you cannot avoid them to save your your life man and there's something absolutely terrifying about the fact that there's nowhere to run there's nowhere to hide they're all over the place and it's just the idea of surviving hour to hour minute to minute and if you survive to the next day, you're goddamn lucky in order to do it. I, there is something about that that I really enjoy and the complete and other clusterfuck chaos of it that is really cool, man. So that I do appreciate, man. So I got to admit, where other franchises have kind of failed in the fifth movie and less than stellar results, the Forever Purge actually kind of bucks the trend a little bit. Not gonna lie, man. Is there any other fifth films and franchises that have either really impressed or really failed? Definitely let me know, man. I gotta tell ya, fifth films and horror franchises, boy, they're a real doozy. The Forever Purge is yet another one to use as an example, but in a good way, actually, which is crazy to say. And I thought I'd never say that about the Purge movie. That the Purge movies, yes, they're not exactly the most stellar shit of all time. They're not exactly the most iconic horror films you'll ever watch. Nor the most bloodiest or goriest. But they've actually been pretty consistent. And when it comes to horror franchises, and guys, I've seen enough of them. Consistency ain't always there. So at least you gotta give them credit for that, man. Twist the Blu-ray digital for sixteen ninety-nine. Nice. London's greatest con artist just found a new recruit. Who <laughs> indeed they did. Oliver. May I have some more, sir? <laughs> uh, and apparently is inspired by the iconic novel Oliver Twist. And I watched this thing and I'm like Really? <laughs> Wait a minute, did Oliver Twist ever do, like, heist to steal paintings? Man, what novel were they reading? <laughs> Seriously, like, what the hell? Oh, man, Lena Hetty, Michael Caine, don't get caught. 
Get Out. And this seriously was inspired by Oliver Twist? Oh, okay, whatever they say. I mean, basically, it is about Oliver. He's on the street. He's a graffiti artist. He's sort of lost in his life. And he's on the run. And he finds a lot of these misfits who are con artists and who steal for a living and they're like one big weird happy family apparently and he sort of joins their crew and it's sort of the misadventures that go on from there i didn't hate the movie exactly i mean as a criminal heist type of movie it has the twists and turns it has the setups the payoffs the betrayals so Technically, it does check off all the boxes, all right? It's just kind of a good movie, so-so. I'm going to be real with you guys, man, because in about three or, hell, I'll be nice, six months' time, I'm probably going to forget about this movie. I really am because it's not iconic. It's not memorable. It doesn't leave much of an impression on you. It's pretty forgettable, all things considered, man. The characters are fine. The setup is fine. And you can see that it's trying to ape off of, like, the Guy Ritchie movies. Like, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, Snatch, or, like, Steven Soderbergh in Ocean's Eleven or something. You can see that it's trying to do those type of movies. But it just can't pull it off, man. It, it really isn't able to do it i mean it's not like anyone's terrible here i mean michael kane is decent lena hetty is decent but yet at the same time they're kind of on autopilot like you're watching the movie and you're like okay they're not giving bad performances necessarily they're still good michael kane is michael kane lena hetty is still lena hetty they're good actors but they don't exactly, like, come off as, like, oh, I'm really going to remember their performance in twists. Like, you don't really get that from them. It just seems like an easy paycheck, and they showed up, did their lines, didn't suck, and moved on to the next thing. That's pretty much what this movie is, man. Why Guy Ritchie is Guy Ritchie? Because he has a great sense of style and comedy and he could do a comedy caper film, and it works brilliantly. Even someone like Steven Soderbergh is able to do that. These filmmakers aren't exactly able to pull it off with the same sort of panache that those filmmakers can do, man. I didn't feel a real connection to the characters, a real connection to the plot, or any of the hijinks that was going on. It was all kind of mundane and all kind of blah. Like I said, it was an easy watch, it was a fast watch, it breezed by, but nothing that really stuck out to me as, oh my god, I'm really going to remember this scene where they, you know, stole this this wild painting, wow, nothing like that, man. It's good for a light watch if you've seen all the Guy Ritchie stuff, but if you're looking for something memorable you look elsewhere. If you're looking for great performances by Michael Caine and Lita Hetty, look elsewhere. If you're looking for an effective caper film, look elsewhere. I mean, when the great Muppet caper is better than Twist, that says something, <laughs> okay? Hell, that movie's a hell of a lot more iconic than this movie will ever be. I mean, hell, I'd rather watch Oliver Twist over again than watch this movie, which is uh, weird to say because I haven't watched Oliver Twist since... I don't know, high school? <laughs> Jeez. I'd probably watch that over this m movie. Twist doesn't have anything clever or really anything interesting to offer except for an average mundane heist movie that you've seen over and over again. And honestly, who really wants that? Put on your best outfit, darling. We're going to a seance <laughs> in Blythe Spirit, the DVD for twelve ninety nine. True love never dies. Oh, I do like that cover. A little cheeky. I'm really digging it, man. Dan Stevens, Leslie Mann, Isla Fisher, Judy Dench. Well, Dame Judy Dench. I got to get that one right. She deserves the dame all day long, man. Indeed, she does. Oh, man. Oh, man. So I got a chance to watch this thing on Amazon Prime, and I didn't really know what to expect with this movie. 
there's actually an original movie from 1945 that I've never seen, but I saw the trailer, it doesn't look half bad, and I know it's been a play for decades, man, so I was like, okay, I'm gonna give this thing a look, and it's interesting, basically it's about, um, this guy who's a screenwriter that kind of has writer's block, he's struggling a lot, and he sees this performance by this woman played by Dame Judi Dench, and... She's sort of this mystic madame, but kind of a fake and phony, but he invites her over to do this sort of seance to sort of give him inspiration, but what he doesn't realize is that the seance actually works, and his first wife, his dead wife, now he can see her, and now it's all these sort of wacky complications of of seeing her and her coming back into his life, and... Oh my god, all the all the wacky weirdness that, that, that has to happen in this wild movie, man. Basically, it's Downtown Abbey meets Ghost. And I'm totally serious about that one, guys. It honestly is, man. That's basically to sum it up. That's what you're getting, man. Except for Whoopi Goldberg running around with Patrick Swayze's spirit inside her. Damn. I knew this movie was missing something. <laughs> I did, man. But I really do enjoy this movie, man. I thought it was really fun, incredibly entertaining, with quirky characters and quirky scenarios. I thought the acting was phenomenal. I thought everybody was having a ball playing these characters and dressing up and, and doing this period piece comedy. I actually do love old school period piece comedies, man. There's a really great one, my favorite Woody Allen movie of all time, and that is Bullets Over Broadway. There's something about the zany comedy in that and the weird characters and the setting and and the dressing up and everything that that just there's something about it that I really love. Even a Woody Allen movie like Midnight in Paris that I always really enjoyed, man. The the charm of that and the quirky comedy. This one is one of those movies that is right up my alley, man. It is absolutely perfect, man. And everybody's playing it the right way. They're playing a sort of straight face with a little bit of a comedic edge to it. And I really like that, man. I thought this movie was fun. Fun and incredibly entertaining, and I dug the hell out of it. I really did, man. I wish they made more movies like this. I mean, they do, but they're not half as fun, man. There's something about old-school classic period piece comedies that I love and I really do dig, man. I don't know whether it's the the old-school comedic sensibilities or just sort of the wink and nod that the actors do but I really enjoy that man and this movie has that in spades I enjoyed it and again it was a really new experience for me because I had never seen any of the play stuff or the original movie from 1945 so for me this was all brand new and I really dug it man I did it might not be for everybody. It might not be up everybody's alley, but it definitely was mine, man. Definitely enjoyed this quite a bit. What a fun one, man. Fun indeed. Definitely get a chance. If you're into these type of movies, you would definitely enjoy that for sure, man. And my God, man, some pretty cool stuff. Some indie love, some new release love. Target was definitely bringing it this week. Not bad at all. Let's head out. Well, the physical media love continues at Target. Indeed, it does, man. They delivered yet again. Not a crazy, plentiful physical media week, per se, but they did have a little bit more than Walmart. The new release love, a little bit of indie titles as well. Yeah, they did their due diligence just a little bit, man, so give them credit for that. However, I'm going to take points away, guys. I am going to take a little bit of points away because of this. So, if you remember, long while back, Target ended up taking away space from physical media. They had like another aisle or so of movies and they put more books in, okay? Ugh, you know my opinion on that one, guys. But now they have shrunk down the physical media even more was that even possible? Yeah, I guess it is, guys, because now you have a half a row here, right, of movies, and then they put in more books here. So now, instead of a full, whole thing of movies, it's now a half of movies, and then a half a shelf of movies over here, 
with all of the music, C CDs, LPs, you name it. They have all that. And then they have the new release Island right there as well. That is it, guys. There is no more whatsoever. And that really sucks, man. <sighs> Yet again, Target is paring down the physical media. Oh, <laughs> boy, that guts me. That, that really burns my buns, goddammit. Oh, man. I mean, I seriously could not keep all of this shelf just physical media. I mean, really, how many books are they actually selling in this motherfucker? <laughs> Thank God, man. They are selling too many books. They ought to be selling the physical media. I mean, Target has been really good with physical media as of late. They've been really putting out all of the new stuff, having a lot of stuff to show off. So I give them points on that, but then they go and do this. They end up cutting down the physical media even more. <sighs> it makes me, being a physical media fan, just a little bit of a... A little bit of a downer, guys, but they still have a little bit of physical media love, not nearly enough as they should, and you guys know that I, when I want my physical media, I want it big time, man. Oh, just not enough as it needs to be. That being said, they do have a little bit of horror love over here, though. They're getting ready for a little bit of October goodness, dare I say. I mean, they've got Predator, they've got a, the Alien Quadrilogy, they've got Resident Evil, Halloween 2018, Annabelle's The Leprechaun. Now talk about a fifth film in, in a series that is really high. <laughs> you know, Leprechaun goes in the hood. Man, I've never seen a Leprechaun get so high in my life. <laughs> Uh, and then the Paranormal Activity franchise, which the fifth film, the marked ones, not bad. Not great, but not not bad either. Hmm, that's not a bad fifth, fifth, fifth film either. They have that, they also have, ooh, Evil Dead 2 Love and Evil Dead as well. And when you're talking about October, you have to talk about a little groovy Ash Love. Indeed you do, man. So they did their due diligence this week. They have some horror love, but seriously, ah, oh, Target. You got back into my good graces. Naughty, naughty, naughty. I'll have to have a little talk with the management and set this shit straight, man. <laughs> we need more physical media and love, not less. I know you guys agree with me. Easier said than done, but they... Half and half with Target. They still do their due diligence on physical media, but... Wow, wow. <sighs> Yet again, the struggle for physical media continues, as always, guys. But I'm always on the side of physical media love, as I know you are, and sometimes Target is... at times. Oh, boy. Well, interesting this week, for at least what they had. Let's see what else we can find. All right, everybody. We are at our third location the second Walmart. I'm going to go in and check out if there's any interesting indie flicks worth showing off. If there is, I will bring it back to Film Fan 108 HQ and show it off to each and every one of you. But before I do that, I want to talk about a trailer with you guys. And it's the most wonderful time of the year. Ding, ding, dong. No, I'm not talking about Christmas. I'm talking about Hawkeye, damn it! <laughs> you people. Oh, man, yes, uh, Hawkeye is coming very, very soon, November, to a Disney Plus subscription near you. Now, I had heard that they were making the show, and my first initial thought was, why Hawkeye? Wait a minute, really? Hawkeye? And then I thought about it a little bit, because I'm like, Hawkeye has never exactly had the biggest role in any of the films. Not as much of the spotlight, I would say. I mean, he had a small, maybe couple-minute role in Thor, obviously much bigger in The Avengers, but he was mostly, like, under the influence of Loki and a bad guy. Had a great role in Avengers Age of Ultron. Thought he was really good in that. Got to see a hell of a lot more of Hawkeye. And, of course, I really loved him in... Obviously, Avengers Endgame. I thought he was really good in that, man. And overall, I've really liked 
the relationships that he's made with some of these characters. I've liked what he's done. I mean, especially in Captain America's Civil War, where he has, you know, a little bit more of a rapport with Scarlet Witch. And, and, and I kind of like where they've went with the character at times, but they've never really highlighted and spotlighted him in a way that really made the character extra significant. He always felt like a side player in a lot of ways. A significant side player, but still a side player. So I thought, wow, it's kind of cool that they're doing this show because you finally have a chance to put Hawkeye front and center in his own series and really give that character the highlight that he really deserves. And Jeremy Renner really deserves it too, man, because I've always liked Jeremy Renner. I can't say Jeremy Renner is the best actor in the world. I can't say Jeremy Renner is the best action star in the world, but he's kind of, if you really think about it, Jeremy Renner has really been given the short shaft a lot of times, man. I mean, through these Marvel movies, he's had some decent roles here and there, but, you know, nothing really hugely major. He was supposed to take over the Mission Impossible franchise. Do you remember that? He was, he was in a couple of the movies, and apparently it was going to lead to Tom Cruise leaving the franchise and him coming in, and... Yeah, Tom Cruise just said, damn, I'm having too much fun with this shit. Yeah, he's not taking over. I'm staying, man. And really, you haven't seen Jeremy Renner since. So that happened. Of course, obviously, the Born Legacy happened. And, oh, man, dude. Like, he was supposed to have his own franchise, man. He was supposed to take over for Matt Damon. And, dude, that shit just never happened, man. He's had a lot of opportunities. And for one reason or another... It always blows up in his face. And I feel so bad for the guy. So incredibly bad. Because it's not his fault. It just ends up turning out really bad. And missed opportunities. Man. So seeing this. Seeing him getting his own show. I kind of think is. It is overdue. Let's, let's be real. It is man. And I like the idea of it being towards the Christmas time and there's this person out there who perhaps is taking over his persona from when he was really in his dark days in between Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame. And he's got to figure out who is doing this, who's behind this, team up with this younger girl who is just as deadly as he is and what's her deal and try to figure out the the mystery and intrigue of who is after him and I do really dig the trailer man I think it's fun I think it's cheeky it's got some good action and some humor mixed into it it's not completely ultra serious but it's not ultra like funny cheese factory either like it's got a mixture of both it kind of reminds me a lot of die hard <laughs> like it really does the whole christmas theme the whole you know um him having having to go up against these bad guys and and people framing him like it felt like he was playing john mcclain and i was like where the hell's bruce willis in this damn thing man and then i thought oh yeah we we don't want bruce willis anymore <laughs> Yeah, no, no, fuck that, man. So I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of digging that vibe. Like, it feels like very early Die Hard, like, like Die Hard 2 or some shit. Like, so I'm like, okay, I can kind of dig that, man. But I'm liking his rapport with Haley Steinfeld. I, I love Haley Steinfeld, man. I think she's really awesome, incredible actress, has a great personality and charm. I think she can bring a lot to this show, especially playing Kate Bishop which I know is from the comic books, which I know fans are really excited to check that out. And also, I was looking on IMDb, and Florence Pugh is in the show. Obviously, Yelena from Black Widow, and I, I am really excited about that, because I loved Black Widow, and I love that character. And if you saw the end credit scene in Black Widow you kind of get a sense of why she would be here in the show. And it makes complete and utter sense, man. And I can't wait to see her character develop more here and her relationship with Hawkeye and how that's going to pan out. 
it seems like they are really going out of their way to set up the Marvel mythology and the Marvel series, you know, going forward in future iterations in these TV shows. And I am really glad because look, Kevin Feige said, he said, look, these TV shows are going to be just as important as the movies and you have to watch them because if you don't, you're going to miss out on a lot of things that will be in certain movies and it'll just pass you by. And he was right. There is a lot of things in these movies that are incredibly important, but it's the TV shows that are almost as important as, as the movies. And it is required viewing, especially if you are a Marvel fan, somebody who is invested in this. This this now Disney shows are essential viewing. And whether you like it or not, it really is, man. And so I'm digging it. I'm digging the fun, entertaining quality here. The nice sort of back and forth r r rapport and humor mixed with the action. I think it could be really cool, man. I, it's got a cool nod and certain interesting aspects to it with sort of the, the whole Avengers thing and making fun of that. And I sort of like the fact that they're not taking themselves too seriously, but yeah, yet at the same time, they still want to advance the mythology and really make these characters the driving force of, of the whole franchise going forward. I'm digging this. I really am, man. I don't know whether you guys are, but I think it's about time that we get more Hawkeye love, man. Lord knows that character has been really underdeveloped. So this is a chance to really bring him into the spotlight, bring Jeremy Renner a little love, and hey, who doesn't like, you know, badass Marvel characters, man, fighting each other? I've loved it. Hell, Civil War, man, proved that you can do some badass fights with some Marvel characters, man. It is true. So I'm looking forward to this. I really am, man. Who knows if it's going to be like the best Marvel show? It's hard to beat some of the stuff that's come out yet, but... I think at the very least, Hawkeye will be fun, and I'm definitely looking forward to that. I really am. Let me know what you guys think about that. In the meantime, let's go into the second one, and hopefully some indie love worth checking out. All right, everybody, in at the second Walmart. Indeed, baby. And last week, all the indie love was quite plentiful, wasn't it? Oh, it was poured out of our physical media buttholes, baby. Something like that. <laughs> So here I am thinking to myself, okay, it's a slower physical media week. Maybe we might see something, maybe not. And much to my surprise, we do see something. Not a lot, not as plentiful as last week, but hey, any weird, bizarre indie media love? Oh yeah, I'm on that shit in a big bad way. Indeed I am, man. So you know what that means. Come on. We are heading back to Film Fan 108 HQ where you said, oh yes, you are going to show off all that weird indie love. You up for it? Just hold on, Blue Rays in the deep and don't let him go. If you ain't a collector's edition, you gonna lose it, Eddie. You gonna lose control. Wait a minute, did you just sing? Yes, I'm singing. Do you like my voice? I know you do. No. Just show off the physical media, damn it. Of course, everyone's gotta be a critic, don't they? I'm gonna remember this one. You bet your ass I am going to remember it, damn it. Fine, I will show off the physical media. I mean, not gonna lie, I was gonna stop singing anyways. I gotta rest my vocal cords. I gotta keep them fresh, because you never know when the big time is gonna call and I'm gonna make my own album, I'm gonna get rich and famous. Any minute now, I am waiting for that phone call, guys. You better watch out, Madonna. I'm coming after your ass. <laughs> Indeed, I am. Look, I get famous, I make a lot of money, I buy more movies, come on, guys, that's the end goal. The fame comes the fortune, Comes more movie love, of course, man. That's the game plan. It always is the game plan. And my voice is going to get me far. Maybe. <laughs> Let's hope, guys. Uh, in the meantime, yeah, I guess 
I gotta show off some movie love. Pipe down the pipes for a second and show off the movies. Now, yes, this week is a little bit of a slower one, that's for sure. But you can still find some good movie love every now and again if you search just a little bit, guys. And if the second Walmart has proven anything over the years, it has proven that you can find some really weird titles out there in the in the ether just waiting to be found and picked through. And these ones, oh, a little weirdness and bizarreness definitely go a long way. The trials and tribulations of the weird, the bizarre, the ridiculous. But when it comes from the second Walmart and you get this type of selection, Oh, you know what you're in for, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, you definitely do. And I can't wait to dive in. Let's do it, baby, with the first half that I'm seeing, and that is none other than Hunter Low. A little ominous cover right there. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. No shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, what are we in for for a hunter? Let's see here. Braising a post-apocalyptic action juggernaut starring Ian Zurig. Ian Zurig, wait a minute. The blonde hunky guy from 90210? Seriously? Well, I always like my post-apocalyptic adventures with former 90210 husbands. Great. <laughs> Jeez. Several years after the virus has ravaged the world, soldier John T. Rucker continues his task of protecting a group of refugees in the base to which he was assigned. In spite of scarce supplies and an ever-dwindling discovery of survivors, as he goes about his daily routine, the threat of something new and even more dangerous grows ever closer in the form of monstrous mutants. The arrival of another soldier from a different outpost gives John hope that they might be able to fight this horrific new threat together. But with time running out and the new mutations closing in, John is facing the annihilation of his mission and the lives that rely on him. Oh, and let me guess, Ian Zurich is John T. Wrecker. <laughs> <laughs> of course, why wouldn't he be? Oh, man, good lord. Post-apocalyptic adventures. I mean, there there is a lot of them out there, to be fair, man. I mean, obviously, the ones that come to mind, clearly, The Road, that's an easy one to, to come up with. Obviously, there's other ones out there, like you know, The Book of Eli is one that comes to mind as well. Even something like 28 Days Later, 28 Weeks Later, those are good post-apocalyptic tales as well. There's also some other really good ones out there. I mean... Some of the ones that I was thinking of, for instance, we do have a little The Stand love. Stephen King's The Stand, the original miniseries, not the remake, the original, man, which I really do dig and really do enjoy, man. That's good little post-apocalyptic tale. Really dig that one a lot, man. That is really good. Of course, I was also thinking of a movie like Stakeland which I really enjoy. Yes, it's vampires, but it is post-apocalyptic, which I do love the post-apocalyptic tale, mixing it in with the vampires. That's some pretty solid shit, man. That is really, really good. And there's a whole host of other ones out there that are really great as far as post-apocalyptic is concerned, man. Absolutely. So where does Hunters fall in? I don't know. I mean... I love a good, like, you know, monsters mutating type of adventure. It kind of reminds me of another mo movie that I really dig. Annihilation. Damn, do I love Annihilation, man. I guess you could categorize this as post-apocalyptic, but I like the idea of the mutating creatures and the monsters within this bubble and how... They're getting more clever and more smart, and they're mimicking human behavior. Very, very fascinating. You can categorize it in sci-fi and horror. Some really wonderful elements. Beautifully well done. Incredibly haunting. Really love Annihilation, man. Really, really do great, great flick, man. So, 
there is some ways to do it good. Then again, you have hunters. <laughs> so I don't know, man. I mean, do you seriously think it's even going to touch Annihilation? I highly doubt it. I don't think it's going to touch some really great post-apocalyptic stuff out there like 20 Days Later or Stakeland. It's just not going to do it, man. I mean, you've got Ian Zurig in this motherfucker, man. The guy from the Sharknado flicks, okay? If you're expecting quality... Man, you came to the wrong fucking movie. <laughs> that is for a damn sure, man. You definitely came to the wrong ass movie, man. I don't know, dude. I mean, maybe it'll be fun and slightly entertaining, but I have a feeling that this is going to be real cheapo with real cheapo effects, man. I mean, if all you could really get is a Beverly Hills 90210 has been... What are you really expecting from this goddamn thing? I mean, come on, guys. Seriously, man. I love good post-apocalyptic tales. I'm a sucker for them, but even I know garbage when I see it. Sorry, Ian. You might have once a long time ago been the talk of the town, but now, well, you're the talk of the cheap. And Hunters, well... It's another one right down your alley. Damn, man. We must be really fucking desperate because if we're recruiting primitives now, actually, my ass actually might have a shot. <laughs> no lie, man. In CIA, ape, a secret agent who does not work for peanuts. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, how, how many puns are we going with this one? Oh, Lord. Oh, and did we expect anything less? Dove approved, baby. Dove approved. Of course. How could it not be? Oh, brother. Saving the world one banana at a time. Motherfucker. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, the puns just keep keep coming, man. One after a goddamn mother. Oh, and look. He knows how to be on a like small little rocket propeller. Great. Not only are we recruiting the primitives, but they're actually more smarter than us. Damn, man. Our education has went to the fucking toilet. <laughs> it really has if we're recruiting this motherfucker. Oh, god damn it, man. God damn. Go bananas. Get it? With this hilarious and exciting family action comedy featuring Sam, a talking chimp, trained for spying and fighting, and yeah, no kidding, huh? And his teen female partner, Bondi James. Oh, Bond? James Bond? <laughs> oh, boy, I think they had to... You know, really try hard for that one, guys. Oh, I think they did. Oh, yeah, right. Bondi must guide Sam on a treacherous mission if Wolfhound Island to stop Alpha Dog's plans for world domination. But Sam unexpectedly forms a bond with the mad genius's neglected daughter, Rebecca. Will Sam stop monkeying around? Another goddamn fucking bond. <laughs> Jesus Christ, there's a million of them here, man. Long enough to sabotage Alpha's evil plot and save the world from his snarling, drooling robot dog. Ooh, will the CIA ape save the day? Will the friendship between Bondi James and the ape survive? Will they defeat the evil genius? No shit. <laughs> Come on, man, give me a fucking break. Oh, Lord, man. Come on, man. Damn. I know it's for the kids, man. I know it is, and I shouldn't take a big shit on it, but you know me. I'm going to do it, man. I mean, it's not that there isn't good, you know, adventure movies with animals in them, right? I mean, I watched them when I was a kid, like Air Bud. I watched that shit out of Air Bud, man. I enjoyed that stuff. I mean, I really love that baseball movie with uh, Matt LeBlanc was with the chimpanzee. And the chimpanzee was like, like the pitcher or some shit. Something like that. I think it was called Ed. 
Yeah, God, it's been so long since I've seen that one, man. My God. Oh, and Matt LeBlanc actually thought that was good for his career. God damn. Man, he had hope he fired his agent, dude, because that man, that agent deserved that shit. I mean, I really love Hot to Trot. If you remember Hot to Trot, man, oh, so good, dude. Oh, my God, man. Hot to Trot is fucking amazing. Dabney Coleman is great in there. Oh, Lord. <laughs> that is one funny ass fucking movie man i mean i enjoy those of course i have to say that i enjoy the planet of the apes movies man i love the planet of the apes man some of my favorite movies happen to be planet of the apes love 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 this series so much not really a comedy not exactly real apes but goddamn impressive man if we had more love like planet of the apes and the world would be a hell of a lot better than CIA ape. Seriously. Oh, man. <laughs> God damn it. I don't know, man. I like a good, like, uh, government conspiracy, on the run agent, taking on the bad guys type of movie. I love the James Bond movies, man. So it's basically just a comedy Take out James Bond and put an ape in it. Sure. I wonder if he likes his bananas peeled, not mashed up. <laughs> you know, he's got to have a catchphrase. I mean, come on, guys. <sighs> I had to join in the bad ape jokes. I really had to, man. I couldn't have Dove take all of the love out of it, man. I had to have one or two. Ah, shit. <laughs> Seriously? Oh, man, uh, it it might be a fun movie, okay? It might be a little fun adventure film for the kids to enjoy, but seriously, man, I'd probably just have them watch Twilight. And that's really fucking sad. <laughs> that's really sad, man. But they might get more enjoyment. Well, Bella, Edward, bad CGI wolves. Okay, maybe not as much fun, but you can make more fun of it. And that could be a plus. I don't know, guys. Seriously, I don't know if I would be expecting anything out of this. Maybe just a weird, quirky hour and a half, take your mind off shit and don't think. Then again, that's probably what they did when they were making the goddamn thing. <sighs> And they're aping off of Mission Impossible. They're aping off of James Bond. They're probably aping off of Bourne. I can't wait to see them ape off of John Wick. Oh, my God. <laughs> Lord, I don't want to give them any ideas, even for a sequel. Lord, God. Oh, sure, why not? Well, the good news is that the government actually doesn't really need to pay them. All they need to do is pay them in bananas. And, by the way, those are pretty cheap. So, actually... For him to save the day, honestly, we're getting away pretty cheap, guys. And that ain't half bad. Watch out for the evil next door. Because <laughs> it's coming for you. <laughs> Indeed it is, baby. Inspired by true events, huh? Hmm. Fear has a new home. <laughs> Oh, sure. What are we in store with this one, baby? Inspired by true events. Let me tell you something. Any horror movie that says they're inspired by true events, just know, guys, that it's always extremely, and I mean extremely loosely based at the very best, man. Sometimes the most loosest of connections. Take it with a grain of salt, guys. That's for damn sure. Ooh, look at that. Creepy, weird kids that are stalking other kids. Ooh, the creep factor has just been turned to 11, baby. Oh, indeed it has. What is this? New to her stepmom role, Shireen moves into a small town duplex with her partner, Frederick, and his son, Lucas. The new home feels like the right place to start becoming a family, but when Frederick leaves for work, mysterious noises are heard from the uninhabited side of the duplex. Also, who is Lucas's new friend? 
Sharon soon realizes that they are haunted by an evil that wants Lucas at any cost, and only she can stop it. Oh, can she now? Ah, yes. Vulnerable little kids, man. I gotta tell ya, it is a genre in and of itself, especially in horror, man. There are so many ones like it. Obviously, you go to It Chapter 1, you go to The Babadook, you go to so many others out there that is is really great, like The Good Son or something, right? I mean, vulnerable little kids, it's, it's always really terrifying, mostly terrifying. Sometimes it can be quite annoying, but they do pull it off for the most part, man. There is some really, really good ones out there. I mean, Poltergeist is a really great one, right, guys? However, I would also argue that Poltergeist 2 and Poltergeist 3 is pretty good, man. I do love these two ones quite a bit, man. I really do love it. And Kids in Peril, those are some good ones. That is for damn sure, man. I also really love... And, of course, I have to say this one. It's a no-brainer, and that is Pet Cemetery. Oh, one of the best. Oh, it really is, man. Talk, talk about vulnerable kids, creepy kids. It has got it all, man. It is amazing. But one that definitely comes to mind when I think of this movie, and that is Come Play. Ah, yes. Come play. One of the more recent horror flicks to come out in the last couple years or so. So, so good, man. I love Come Play. This movie was amazing, man. Look at that. Oh, that creepy entity is coming for you. <laughs> it is so good, man. Basically, this little kid has this story on his, his device that he reads from. And it's slowly trying to take him over through technology. So fantastic. So many really great scary moments, creepy moments. The entity is scary as fuck. It is so, so great, man. Love, love this movie, man. And there are so many more movies like it with children in peril. I mean, I've got a ton of them in the collection, man. Oh, but how about the evil next door? I mean, can it really compare to other ones out there? Even the movie like Orphan Mitch is so amazing, man. This is more of like a ghostly evil entity attacking a kid and wanting to take over him, which I really do appreciate, man. But there have been so many movies like that over the years. And the genre has sort of been played out to a certain degree as well. I mean, there's been so many movies like that that you kind of know where everything is going. It tends to get a little bit predictable. It's not always a bad thing sometimes, though, because, again, you'll get movies like Come Play, which really is amazing and really, like, shows that they could do some really cool, genuine scares with that genre still to this day. But few and far between, man. It's an interesting idea... If done well. Ooh, I like that. Look at that. Oh, look like something out of the fucking Exorcist or something, man. Damn. It could be good, man. It has the potential to be. Could creepy moments, a scary evil entity. Not like we haven't seen it before. This is nothing new or original, but if done well, it could be effective. It doesn't have to be a big blockbuster movie. It could be on the cheap and still be effective. The Evil Next Door has potential. Will it scare up the potential? That's a whole nother question, guys. Uh, we'll see how this one goes. But as far as being inspired by true events, yeah, take it with a grain of salt, guys. But if this actually happened, if this was true, if there was an evil entity living in the duplex next to you, let's be real. I don't care how much the rent is. My ass is moving the fuck out. You got the touch. Bye, bye. You got the power. With the Shut Original of the power. <laughs> yes, I couldn't resist, guys. Fear of the darkness inside of you. Oh, yes, I like that, baby. I like that a lot. Oh, man. Some weird black hole with some crazy, weird fucking monsters coming out of it. 
Oh, this is right up my alley, baby. Oh, it definitely looks it, man. Very nice. Ooh, a profoundly unsettling thriller with a performance that would make Linda Blair proud. Hmm, would she? Huh, see what this is about, guys. London, 1974, as Britain prepares for electrical blackouts to sweep across the country, trainee nurse Val arrives for her first day at the crumbling East London Royal Infirmary. Boy, what a first day she must be having. With most of the patients and staff evacuated to another hospital, Val must work the night shift in the empty building. Within these walls lies a deadly secret, forcing Val to face her own traumatic past in order to confront the malevolent power that's intent on destroying everything around her. Oh, very nice, man. Very, very nice. Damn, I like that synopsis, man. And it definitely reminds me of another film that I love so much, man. The Last Shift. Oh, all hail the king of hell. <laughs> <laughs> I've talked about this movie before, man, but it bears repeating, dude. I love this movie, man, and it has similar vibes because, obviously, this female cop in this abandoned building looking over this body and weird things start to happen and weird-looking people and perhaps monsters and possibly a portal to hell... A lot of weird shit happens in this movie, man, and I thought it was fucking brilliant, man. I love the hell out of this movie, man. I mean, that is really, really great, man. I love the hell out of that. And I just love the idea of somebody's past coming back to haunt them. I love that, man, because we all have a past. Let's be real, man. Whether we're proud of it or not, we all do. And sometimes, whether we like it or not, it also ends up catching up to us. And I love that idea behind that, of this woman who's trying to change her life and get past some of her demons, but this night won't let the past go. Oh, man, do I love that shit. I really do, man. This has the potential to be really creepy, some great atmosphere, some really good scary moments. It has some really solid potential, man. It really honestly does, man, about faith and regrets and looking forward, but yet having to look back in order to move ahead in your life, like, I, I love so much of what this movie could be giving me, then again, it is a Shudder movie, look, I'm gonna be real with you guys, Shudder is not exactly the best, it's not, from time to time, they really do surprise me, man, I mean, some of the Shudder movies, like, the Mortuary Collection has been amazing, it's been really, really good, even something like, I believe, the movie Slacks, which was on Shudder, that one was really good as well, man. Very fun type of horror flick. Then again, they've also had a lot of misses as well. And they tend to ape off of better stories, trying to spin it in their own way, but not nearly as good. Shudder has its moments. Then again, it also has its not-so-great ones, too. Where does the power lie? Perhaps the power lies within a really great story, which could work. Or it has the power to be real shitty. Oh, you never quite know with Shudder, but this movie definitely has potential. And can't say that for all the Shudder movies, so I'll definitely take it, guys. Let me know what you think of the power. Just the cover alone looks really cool, man. I love, like, weird monsters and portals and shit like that, man. It's one of the reasons why I love Hellboy and all the Cthulhu stuff. God, man, monsters are so fucking cool. Damn, dude. And if this has some really cool kick-ass monsters, that might just seal the deal. It just might, man. Hmm. Might be one worth giving a chance to. Hmm, just might, man. I don't know. You guys definitely got to let me know about that one, man. But not bad selection. Not hugely plentiful, but let me tell you something. When it comes to Walmart weirdness, big, small, doesn't matter. It always does the trick.
Uh, Beverly Hills 90210 has been versus Mutant Monsters. Gee, I wonder who's really gonna win that fight. Oh, a secret Agent Abe, a secret Agent Abe. They've given him a number and are taken away is but na 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 I couldn't help myself. Sorry, guys. Oh, little creepy entities stalking creepy kids. Man, I can't wait until my girlfriend and I move into a new place together and have a kid. Oh, man, I can't wait until my kid gets stalked by an evil entity. Uh, I'm sure that's what my girlfriend really wants. I love you, honey. Oh, and man, I'm jealous. I want to be in an abandoned building, you know, being haunted by my past and evil things lurking around. Why can't any of the creepy stuff ever happen to me? Damn it. Oh, man, oh, man, the things that I wish would happen to me. Okay, maybe not. I'm, I'm cool just having my average mundane life, guys. No creepy entities coming after me. No evil entities taking over my kids. <sighs> I'm okay with my humdrum life, guys. As long as I get to show off the movies, I am a very, very happy camper, guys, indeed. As long as I got movies in my life, I'm good, baby. Indeed, I am. Even Walmart weirdness. Oh, indeed, baby. My God. A little bit of Walmart indie love supplies all the crazy wild stuff that I can handle. Indeed, it can, man. And I got to admit, this is why I love physical media so much. It doesn't matter whether it's the big blockbusters or the weird indie cheapo titles that you can only find at Walmart. There's something about finding physical media regardless. Good, bad, indifferent. It just is great to find new physical media out there in the ether, man. You know, everyone has said time and time again, oh, physical media is dead, it's dying, it's done. And maybe there's a tiny bit of truth to that. But every time I see new physical media out there week after week, it gives me hope that there's still people out there that want physical media, that love physical media. I see people going out of their way to grabbing the titles and looking at them. There is still a market for this stuff. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about the big studio stuff or the more indie darlings out there. I think physical media is really worth it for the smaller titles to get out there into the world and the bigger ones that you just love that you want to own, man. There's something about physical media that cannot be denied. In a world of streaming, sometimes hope seems lost that people are still interested in the physical aspect of holding a movie and owning it in the collection. But then again, we've been proven time and time before that physical media can rebound in the best of ways. And I truly believe we are heading towards one of those times, guys. I truly do believe that. I don't know whether you believe it, but I think that good times are definitely ahead, man. And as long as we get some really great stuff we're chat checking out, then it will always be worth it to show off physical media. Hope you guys agree with me. Hope you do indeed, man. But that's not the end of the physical media love. There is more stuff to show off, hopefully. So let's head to the next location for more movie love. All right, everybody. We are at our fourth and final location. And when it comes to physical media, you never know what the beast will have in store. Oh, yes. You know where we're at, guys. The final location being none other than Best Buy the Beast. Best Buy, baby. Oh, yeah. Been quite the interesting day for physical media, dare I say. Interesting releases for sure. But what will Best Buy have in store for us? New release love, steelbook love, some indie stuff we haven't seen yet, some surprises. You never quite know with the Beast. Some weeks are better than others. But what will they have this time around? Let's go in and find out. 
All right, everybody, in at Best Buy under the new releases, and it's looking a little more stock, just a little bit more, man. And with new release love, it's always a good thing to check out the new release area. Oh, yes, indeed it is. And we are seeing the Forever Purge, the Blu-ray DVD digital for $22.99, the 4K Blu-ray digital for $27.99. Ah, yes. More purge love. <laughs> oh, baby. So, I'm kind of curious, right? What do you think about franchises once they get to a certain point? Is it time for them to call it quits? Because I look at the Forever Purge and I still think it's a pretty decent movie, all things considered. I mean, yes, formulaic to a certain degree. You kind of know where certain things are going, but it still is very entertaining. But at a certain point, every franchise sort of starts to spin its wheels, don't you think? I mean, Nightmare on Elm Street, Hellraiser, Friday the 13th, the Saw franchise, Conjuring, I don't think is quite there yet. But I mean, even, you know, superhero stuff like Marvel, they may be starting to spin their wheels just a little bit. Obviously... The DC Universe, well, they can't even get their shit together. So, I mean, once they do, maybe then they can start to spin their wheels. But there's a lot of franchises out there that, at a certain point, enough is enough. We're just, we're just overdoing this at this point. And has the Purge franchise gotten there yet? That's really the big question of it all. Because you've had five Purge movies, you've had two seasons of the TV show, and... Is there anything new and original to do in the Purge universe? That's not exactly the easiest question to do, to be honest with you. I mean, I think you can still make Purge movies, and I think they are, actually. I heard a rumor, Frank Grillo did a interview where he said there's a possibility that he might be doing another one down the line, and I'm like... I guess. I mean, this movie made a decent amount of money, so I understand why they would do it, but do you think it's the responsibility of the people behind the franchise to say, we're done, we're over with, or is it the responsibility of the studio to say, look, we've milked this enough, we can't milk it anymore, why don't we just stop? I know that's easier said than done, and I'm not an executive in Hollywood that, you know wants to just make things ad nauseum no matter the integrity. I get it. I understand it, guys. But there's something about ending a series on a high note that I think looking back on the series, you say, okay, yeah, there was a clunker here and there, but it didn't go completely over the rails. I don't think the purge is there yet, but I think if we continue to do it, I think we're going to get there. Yes, Money talks, bullshit walks, totally un understand that, man. But at a certain point, I think you have a responsibility to the fan base. You have a responsibility to the franchise to let go. I really do, man. I believe the original director of the Purge movies, he did the three Purge films, and then he was out. He was done. And yes, he's still here in the capacity of like a producer and helping to write the stuff, but he's not really there in the driver's seat anymore. And I can understand why. He was only willing to make a few good ones and then walk away. And I really appreciate that, man. Like I said, I can see them making another Purge movie, especially where this one ends. I'd actually like to see certain characters come back in this really great grand finale final Purge film where the survivors of all the other Purge movies sort of come together to, to fight the, the evil Purge people. <laughs> like some shit like that, man. That would be cool, I think. I think it was one final Purge film to end them all. That would be nice. But again... You see, for me, I've seen so many franchises, so many great series go the way of the dinosaur or jump the shark and turn bad simply because they couldn't say no. They couldn't stop. 
And I think the purge is at a reflection point here because I looked at the first purge and I said, eh, it wasn't really great. I understand why they did it, but it, it didn't turn out the way I was hoping it would. Then I look at the Forever Purge and I'm like, okay, it's a complete turnaround and it's actually a better movie and I like where they went with it. Again, not perfect, but I appreciated where they were going. I think there's really only one more movie left here. I, I really do. If they go anything past one more movie, I just don't see it really working out. I mean, do you? Like I said, I thought the shelf life for it was short to begin with. They've gotten five movies and two TV seasons out of this goddamn thing. I mean, congratulations on that. I didn't th even think they'd last that long. But overextending themselves mean every franchise overextends themselves to a certain extent. Some franchises just don't know when to quit. The Forever Purge, I would appreciate if they maybe do one more film and they're out. Let's hope I'm right. If not, boy, I can't wait for Purge 9, 10, and 11. <laughs> You know what, I really wonder when Vin, Vin Diesel's gonna come into this motherfucker. <laughs> he's gonna have a posse and he's gonna be like, we're fighting for family. <laughs> oh, well, fuck you, Vin. Oh, man, god damn it, dude. But all things considered, it's not the greatest movie, but it certainly isn't the worst. Great messaging to, to this film and actually a bounce back from the last film, which I definitely appreciated, man. Not bad at all, dude. You do get uh, alternate storyboard opening, collapsing the system behind the Forever Purge and Creeptastic Wardrobe. Very nice, man. It is one of the better Purge movies. I definitely will say, say that, man. And when the Purge started and I saw the first movie with Ethan Hawke, I would, did not dig that movie, man. I, it was like a home invasion film, but the idea of the Purge is so grand and... and they could have done so much more with it. And then I saw the second and third film, and I'm like, okay, this is what I wanted. This is what I wanted out of a Purge movie. And I think the the, the first Purge kind of let me down. The TV show, it didn't really butter my bread the way I wanted it to, guys. But the Forever Purge sort of got me back. And now that it has, I think they should start to call it quits. I don't know what you guys think, but... Better to not overextend yourself. Better to sort of leave people wanting more. Just put it that way, man. Great movie. And now I'm setting up a purse shelter for myself. I, it, it's a man cave. It's a man cave with all my movies, uh, shotguns, bow and arrows, you name it. Because when the purse starts, I'm going to have a comfy ass seat, watching good ass movies, and getting ready to kill some evil motherfuckers. Want to join me? Looky, looky what we got here. A little Steelbook exclusive love. 4K Blu-ray Digital. 1999 for 3 from Hell. Yes, unrated Rob Zombies 3 from Hell. Oh, baby, baby, baby. Hey, there's baby. <laughs> oh, man. God damn, do I really dig this movie, dude. And... I actually forgot that Best Buy was doing an exclusive for 3 from Hell in Steelbook 4, man. This looks sweet. Look at that, man. That's pretty cool, dude. Nice. I love when Best Buy does their exclusive Steelbooks. I can't say that I love every Best Buy exclusive Steelbook, so sometimes the artwork is like dog doo-doo. But that being said, sometimes they really hit it out of the park, and this one is cool. And I actually heard that when you take off the slip of this, it's basically their skulls on the inside, which is awesome. Oh, that's so cool, dude. Look at that. That is awesome, man. That is really goddamn cool. And speaking of Rob Zombie, because you know I got to go there, guys. Ah, Rob. Dude, I love your music, buddy. But man, your track record on film is iffy at best. I mean, here's the truth of it. I really love House of a Thousand Corpses. I love The Devil's Rejects. And I really dig Three from Hell. What do those three films have in common? They're all about the Firefly family. They're all about these crazy misfits. Captain Spaulding, Otis, Baby... Uh, and all of the weirdos in between. I really love and dig those movies a lot, man. And everything else in Rob Zombie's filmography, I don't really like, man. I don't really enjoy much of them. 
I'm not a fan of 31. I'm not really a fan of his Halloween movies. I think those are... Whew, God, don't even get me started on that shit. I mean, not really a fan of that. Lords of Salem. Dude, John, Bob, and I, we fucking laughed our ass off when we went to the movie theater to see Lords of Salem. It was that bad. And not so good it's bad. It's just flat out bad, man. Uh, but... I appreciate Rob's love for the 70s grindhouse cinema, and I appreciate that he tries to replicate at that in movie form. I think sometimes he's successful and not so much, but there's something about these three films, you know, Rejects and Corpses and Three from Hell, there's something about it that's really cool, and I love the characters and the dialogues and the, the crazy gory kills. I love all that stuff, and that world I was so invested in from the word go in House of a Thousand Corpses. I mean, these are despicable and evil scumbags of human beings, but they have a certain charm and a likability to them that you just kind of go with, and you're like, man, I like these people. I would never want to cross them in a dark alley to save my fucking life, but, you know, I mean, I'd hang out with them if they promised not to, to skin me and wear my face. <laughs> I mean, seriously, man. But I just love this world with these despicable characters. If he only made movies with Bill Mosley and his wife playing Otis and Baby and this world of of evil, wicked characters, I would eat that shit up in a heartbeat, man. I really do because I just love diving into these characters and I love rewatching the the movies, man. There's it's just wicked fun that I just love, dude. And if he were to only do that, that would be great, man. I would, I would fucking do Kickstarter and I would contribute to every single fucking campaign if he was making more of these type of movies, man. I really would. But he makes these other movies that are just not as great, man. I mean, they're not all terrible, but to me, the best that he's ever done is these ones. The Rejects movies. This is the shit. This is my stuff. My love for Rob Zombie. This is where it starts. And I hate to say it. This is where it kind of ends, guys. I love Rob. I think he's somebody who has a great imagination and great creativity. But as a filmmaker, he's got a long ways to go. These movies are good. I think he can do better, but then again, he's doing Monsters next, so... Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure about that one, man. I guess we'll have to wait and see. If they've got Otis and Baby in the Monsters, now we talking. Not gonna lie, now, now we, I'm really digging it, man. <laughs> we'll see where that one goes, but... I mean, you do have special features here. You have the, the making of Three from Hell. You have the audio commentary as well. Nice. Very, very cool shit, man. Very cool indeed. Ah, I love these movies, man. I mean, Rejects is the best. House of a Thousand Corpses I really love. I know a lot of people just shit on House of a Thousand Corpses, but I really dig it. But Rejects is definitely his masterpiece. And I, and I know Three from Hell is not perfect, and I know a lot of people shit on it. But I happen to really love it, man. And as far as a cool trilogy is concerned, with really weird scumbag characters, I will take this trilogy in a heartbeat, man. Again, I love these characters. Love them to death. Just as long as they don't capture me and kill me, guys. I mean, Baby is cool. I definitely get with her. But uh, something tells me I'd be a dead man. But, I die one happy motherfucker. They did get back in more steelbook love, man. They got that saw steel in. Ooh, God, that's a nice one, man. They got that, that back in. Just in the right time, baby, for Halloween season. Liking that. Of course, they got in more Labyrinth love. Such a fucking amazing movie, man. Everybody, and I mean everybody, deserves to have that in their collection, man. No doubt. That, they also have the steelbook for the Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard, which... Uh, despite my not-so-love for this movie, I gotta admit, my love for Selma Hayek is never-ending. <laughs> that is very true, man. I mean, they have that. Ooh, they even have some spiral love, too. Not bad, but I gotta admit, man, they still don't have the Black Widow steel love, which I would love to see. 
<sighs> and I'm still waiting for that goddamn Justice League Steelbook. I may be waiting for a long damn time on those guys, but they do have a little bit of Steelbook love. Not too bad, man. Not bad at all over here. And on the other new release, and uh, ooh, he's a little more lighter, guys. Yikes, man. I mean, they do have some Cruella, but they are slowly running out of that. They have Shawshank, the 4K, but not the Steelbook love. Damn shame, but they do have some Steelbook love left for Rear Window. The thing, yeah, no Steelbook for this one, guys. It's so bad because I heard the Steelbook looks beautiful, but not many people are able to find it, man. When that sold out, that really, really sold out, man. I wonder if they're ever going to get more in. God, let's hope, man, because I love the, the thing, man. And seeing some things, Steelbook Love, that would be sweet indeed. Very, very sweet on that one. I mean, they also have Unbreakable, but of course not the Unbreakable Steel, of course. Why wouldn't they have the Steelbook Love for that? Ay, ay, ay. I mean, they do have Vertigo with some Steel Loves. Obviously, they still have... Zacario as well. I mean, they have a little bit, not a ton. However, they don't have a Clockwork Orange. Man, when that sold out, that sold out big time. No regular 4K and no Steelbook as well. Hmm. Uh, that one, I think, is going to be a toughie to find. I truly do believe that, man. Let's hope they get some more in stock because I want that one badly, baby. That is for damn sure. And I definitely want my Clockwork Orange. That's for damn sure, dude. Uh, lacking on some Steelbook love, but then, honestly, on the other side, they still have some decent Steelbook love over here. So it just depends on, I guess, what Steelbooks you're, you're looking for. Some they'll have, some they're not, but I guess that's all the adventure of movie hunting. Right, guys? Sure. Let's see if they got anything else worth checking out. And then over on the back side, not seeing a hell of a lot. It is a slower week, so not as crazy plentiful. There is a couple things, though. They do have the Blu-ray Digital of Robotech Part 1, man, for $44.99. My God, man, I remember Robotech years and years ago. I remember that stuff, man. I mean, I don't really watch that stuff anymore, but for all you anime lovers... Always like to show it off because I know there's a lot of anime fans out there. So a little Robotech love for you as well. They also have a little bit more of the Fast 9 Steelbook. Why? <laughs> oh, man. Why? God damn it. Seriously. I, I'm not even going to bother. I mean, the movie's a joke in itself. Good Lord. They do have that. They also have... A Porcel Rosso, which is, looks really cool for $20.99 as well. The Studio Ghibli Steelbook, very nice. Best Buy has done a few of these. This looks really nice as well. They have that. They have the Blu-ray Digital of Batwoman, the second season. Very cool on that one. They also end up having, oh, the 4K Blu-ray of Transformers the Movie. Now... This is the regular 4K edition. They did have that Steelbook edition that I showed off, which was really sweet, man. But they finally did come out with a regular 4K uh, edition. And, man, as I've said before in a previous Out and About, fantastic goddamn movie, dude. I used to love Transformers back in the day. I mean, for me, it was Ninja Turtles. It was He-Man. It was Transformers. It was all that stuff that I was eating up, man. I really was. And this was one of the best, man. The movie was sort of like a, the pinnacle of a lot of kids' like childhood love for Transformers, man. Nowadays, unfortunately, Transformers... I mean, Transformers is still a huge, huge franchise and entity. I mean, the, the movies definitely have made it that way. But honestly, if you're an old school fan, a Gen 1 fan... Transformers the movie is where it's at. Ah, forget the live-action Michael Bay garbage. This movie, baby. This movie, man. Nice. They dab that. They also end up having Twist, the Blu-ray digital, for $15.99. And, you know, when I was thinking about this movie, there was some flicks that are kind of equal to it. There's Parker with Statham, King of Thieves, which also has Michael Caine as well, which is not bad. I was also thinking of the movie Shopping. 
from like, I think it was like 1993, four, somewhere around there with Jude Law. Such a really fantastic British crime heist movie. Really, really great film, man. The first film ever directed by Paul W.S. Anderson. We all know where he went in his career, but shopping is one of his best, man. And it has kind of, you know, the the young, impressionable youth on the run and them doing these these crimes and people falling in love and crazy antics and, and, and stealing shit. I mean, it's got all that stuff. But honestly, it's way better than Twisted. I mean, Twist takes a lot of elements from a lot of other films, but just can't make it memorable or interesting or really worth the damn. It's average at best. And that's the best thing I can say about the movie. People were there for a paycheck. They maybe acted a little bit, but they knew this shit wasn't going to win Academy Awards. They knew that this was a straight-to-DVD and Blu-ray movie. It wasn't going to turn any heads, and it really doesn't, man. It's got some interesting ideas, a character or two that could be interesting, but it just doesn't really pull it off, man. Honestly, if you've seen the other caper films or crime move movies you know, impressionable youth on the run, then maybe. But honestly, the movies that this apes off of is so much better. Truly, truly is, man. And that's the honest to God truth on, on that one, guys. I mean, you do get a special feature or two, but that's about it, man. And it is what it is, man. There's so many movies that come out like this year in and year out. So many of them that are just average or milk toast. <laughs> I, I guess that's a compliment, sure, if you want to call it one. But, I mean, I'm not saying they don't have a place in cinema. They do, but at the end of the day, no one's going to remember them. No, no one's going to remember Twist or Catch the Bullet or, yeah, no one's really going to remember uh, Out of Death or Great White, the gateway i mean no one's really gonna do it it's not that they're bad films writers of justice was pretty interesting but i mean some of these movies they come out and they're there to fill a shelf and that's a real shame but it really is the truth man some do eventually stand out and lead the pack and really make a great impression on you but then again there's far more twists out there in the world than there is the exceptional ones but when the exceptional ones do come across, you really do have to cherish them. Then again, there's more milk toast in the world than there is exceptional. I hate to say it, but you know I'm right, guys. You know I am, man. Oh, boy. But it is a slow time here at The Beast, for sure. Not a ton of stuff to show off this week, but it is a little slow. But, hey, we've seen a lot of physical media as of late, so a slow week ain't so bad, especially with the ramp-up coming very soon. Hey, we'll take what we can get for sure, man, because there's so much more coming. Not bad at all, guys. Let's head out. A little bit here, a little bit there. Not a ton to write home about. Not gonna lie, guys. Not a ton to really be like, oh, my God, what an amazing physical media week. Not entirely, but ever so occasionally we do get one of these weeks. That doesn't mean that there still isn't good stuff to check out. There always is. You just gotta search a little bit, guys. But not bad here at The Beast. They did have the big new release. They had a little smaller indie love. They had three from Hal Steelbook action, baby. And that is really, really cool, man. If you are a fan of the Rejects trilogy, that might be something you want to bounce on. You might want to get up on that in a big, bad way. That looks pretty damn sweet, man. Other than that, not a huge amount of physical media love this week but i bet they're saving the love coming up very soon because when the fall hits that's when physical media drops and we may have a little bit of a lull but it's gonna be back in a big bad way definitely stay tuned on that guys but in the meantime oh, a little bit of resting and relaxing for the physical media love this week especially here at the beast hope you enjoyed it overall how about we head home and finish the video all right, everybody, that'll do with the Blu-ray and DVD out and about video this week. And I know it was a little slower compared to some of the other weeks that we've been seeing some really amazing, plentiful physical media. 
And every once in a while, we do get a physical media week that's a little bit on the lighter side. This happened to be that week, guys. I mean, regardless, we still saw some decent new release love, some indie weirdness, a few things here and there, a couple of steelbook surprises as well. Yeah, we saw a few things, guys, here and there. I mean, look, even on a lesser physical media week, you can still find some good things out there. Not as much as a bigger, more bombastic physical media week. However, hey, as a physical media lover, I have learned to take what I can get, especially when it comes to the stores. And not every store always has the physical media love you're looking for. Sometimes it's a little less than what you want. But you take what you can get sometimes. And hey, sometimes physical media is really plentiful, and sometimes physical media is more on the... Yeah, sometimes so, guys, but you know what, man, regardless, I think we still saw a decent amount of stuff, man. Sometimes you gotta realize that physical media isn't always the highest priority, even though I wish it was. <laughs> even though, uh, more praying to the physical media gods. I better get on that soon, guys. But, hope you guys found something good this week. If you did, definitely let me know. As far as I'm concerned, well, I actually did pick up something at Best Buy, guys. Oh, indeed I did. And it's one I definitely wanted for the collection. And that is none other than the Best Buy exclusive steelbook of 3 from Hell. Oh, yes. Look at this beauty. Very sweet, dare I say, man. Let's open this sucker up, actually. So, I do love Three From Hell. As I was telling you guys earlier, I, I really do dig it, man. It's not Rob Zombie's best, okay? I think Rob Zombie's best is definitely The Devil's Rejects. But I, I think it was kind of cool to see him going back to this world. A lot of people want him to go back to this world, and it was just nice to see the characters again, and the scenarios, and the blood paths, and seeing Sid Haig one more time playing S Spaulding. It, it was it was cool, man. I was glad to see it. Oh, look at this. Oh, look at that. Woo, it's sweet. And on the inside. Just what I predicted. Oh, look at that. Cool! Oh, that is awesome. And on the back side... Ah... Uh, love it. The three graves. Cool! Oh, nice. Well, that's sweet, man. I, I like that. Huh. And then on the inside artwork as well. Oh, yeah, look at that. Cool! Well, that's nice, man. Not bad at all, dude. Huh. I can't say that I always rebuy just for the sake of a steelbook, because I really don't always do that. It's not really my preference sometimes, guys. But that being said, there are certain times where I'm like, dude, the steelbook looks really cool, and I kind of have to get it just for the collection. And this is one of those times. Look at that. That's cool, man. Oh, nice. That is pretty sweet indeed, man. Pretty sweet. Now... I can't say that I'm going to be adding much to the Rob Zombie collection. <laughs> I can't. Because outside of the House of Thousand Corpses, Devil's Rejects, and Three from Hell, there's not really other ones I want, to be fair, man. I'm not a Lords of Salem fan, not 31 fan, definitely not a fan of his Halloween movies. So, you know what? Right now, I'll just stick with my love for, for the... Rejects trilogy, which is a bun. I love the Rejects, and like I said earlier, if Rob Zombie were to only do Rejects movies the entirety of his career, I would be completely fine with that. I love these characters. I love Baby and Otis and all these fucked up people that they continue to find every single goddamn film, man. They have, they find more family members just out of fucking nowhere, man. Gee, they're, uh, they're like breeding like rabbits. <laughs> For Christ's sake, man. He's popping out of nowhere. Oh, man. I would love for him to revisit this world again. I, I don't know, man. Maybe like five years down the line or so. I would like to see him revisit again. I mean, Bill Mosley has said he loves playing the character. 
Obviously, Chef Sherry Munzami loves playing babies, so I would love to see them come back to this every now and again. Don't know whether Rob will, but I think these are the movies that he does best. Just my own opinion, but I think these are the movies he's going to be re remembered by. It's not going to be the Halloweens. It's not going to be the Munsters. It's not going to be that, guys. It's going to be the Rejects trilogy. I guarantee to you guys, but... A little more Steelbook love for the collection. Never hurt nobody. Never did indeed. Oh, man. Damn, that's cool. <laughs> that is cool, man. I love that, man. I also ended up picking up on Orbit DVD. I ended up picking up the Blu-ray of Hardball with Keanu Reeves and Diane Lane. I really do dig this movie, man. It's a really great heartfelt Keanu Reeves baseball movie. It truly is, man. Now, when you think of Keanu Reeves, obviously you think of Matrix and John Wick and, of course, Bill and Ted and a few of his other flicks. Nobody really brings up Hardball a lot, and I understand why, because it's not exactly, you know, the most bombastic Keanu Reeves performance, you know? It doesn't have, like, things exploding in the background and him shooting people in the head, like... However, that would have made for a very unique and interesting baseball movie if he started shooting people in the head. I'm like, geez, talk about uh, talk about attacking the other team. What the fuck? Yeah, no, guys. But this one is really great. I love where he gets to learn to really be a part of this baseball team and care for these kids and the life lessons that he learns and they learn along with him. I just think it's a really good, solid baseball movie with some really good drama elements. And it's one that Keanu Reeves does a really great job at, man. He isn't all about the shoot em up shit. He isn't always. Sometimes he does some lighter fare sometimes, like The Lake House. Which is really good, man. A lot of people will forget that Keanu Reeves does more than just the action shoot 'em up stuff. Sometimes we tend to pass the other stuff by. And you gotta recognize that Keanu Reeves is just more than the action dude. He can do a lot of stuff. And Hardball tends to prove that. Really love this flick, man. Really do, dude. I also ended up picking up another one from Orbit DVD. And this is actually a... Mondo Macabro title. Yes, indeed, man. One that I've been looking for for quite a while. And that is none other than The Fan. Ooh, yes, indeed, I have been looking for this one, guys. 17 and obsessed with a pop star. And honey, you ain't the only one. There has been so many over the years that have been obsessed with these t sort of pop stars. And God help us all. Oh, my God. The obsession is real. <laughs> It really is, man. Damn. This one was always sort of one I was interested in. However, the limited edition had passed me by years ago, and it was always one that I wanted to buy, and I was looking on eBay and everything, and the prices on eBay are fucking insane, man. I'm, I'm not... I'm not paying those eBay prices, dude. I'm just not doing it. And so I was like, ah, maybe I, maybe I can look for it in other places. But when Orbit had some on sale, I was like, Orbit has the fan? I'm like, okay, I'm going to pull the trigger, man, because I really want it, dude. It's kind of interesting because basically from what I know about the movie, it's basically about this girl that she loves this, this pop star, really obsessed with him sees him at a concert, he ends up sleeping with her and basically throwing her away like she's a piece of trash, which, honestly, a lot of these pop stars do do that, man. It's not exactly the most biggest secret in the world. that Basically, they take advantage of their fans, but it's the truth. And she becomes just basically, like, on a vengeance trip against this guy. So, I mean, it's it's like... It's like an erotic thriller meets uh, meets a horror flick in some ways. I've heard really amazing things about this movie. It's a foreign flick from Germany, interestingly enough, guys. Huh. Mondo Macabro always does some really unique and interesting movies that have been forgotten by time or no one really knows much about. And they always do some really unique releases and pick titles out that always shock me and 
surprise me in the best of ways, man. And this one looks like one I'm definitely going to enjoy, man. I mean, it's one that I've even talked to my girlfriend about. I'm like, yeah, she's obsessed with this music guy, and then he sleeps with her, and she's on a revenge thing, and she's like, really? And I'm like, yeah. So maybe even my girlfriend might watch this with me, and that's saying a lot. <laughs> So, I, I'm i looking forward to checking this thing out, man. I really do, man. And, yeah, I like the limited editions Mondo has. I like getting the red cases. But, again, the eBay prices are insane for that stuff, man. And I kind of like it with the blue case. It kind of fits a little bit better anyway. So, at the end of the day, it all worked out. I will have it in the collection. So, eventually, sooner or later, I get what I want. Damn it. <laughs> you better believe it, baby. The fan, man. Not bad at all. And last, but certainly not least, I picked up another Scream Factory title for the collection, man. Oh, this one I've been wanting for a while. I haven't pulled the trigger on it, but about damn time when I got it from Orbit DVD. And that is Ravenous. Yes. You are who you eat. <laughs> Well, indeed, it's true, guys. Oh, my God, Ravenous. Dude, I watched Ravenous for the first time years ago. Man, I remember, I think I watched it on Cinemax a long time back. Like, during the late night, I watched it. And I was blown away by this movie. I was like, this movie was funny. It was gruesome. I loved the characters. I was like, this movie is fucking awesome, man. And I, I just I just loved being somebody who is a meat eater, being somebody who's like, you know, I you know, I, I love my meat, goddammit. <laughs> so I was like, wow, can this really happen? Like, can you like eat certain things that will like make you more powerful? <laughs> like I was like, whoa. Man, that's some crazy shit. I really dig this movie, man. I dig it in the most biggest, baddest way, man. I mean, Robert Carlyle is badass in this movie. He is great, dude. He's devious. He's sinister. Man, you don't know what he's going to do next. Love him, man. I love him in this movie so much, man. I think the other actors are fantastic here. Guy Pierce is amazing. Guy Pierce, I just love the idea that this guy is is so obsessed with Robert Carlyle's character, so obsessed with him, like, man, this guy, there's something wrong about this guy. And when he realizes what's wrong with him, it's like, now I want to kill this guy. And it's like the, the like the, like the people are like ready to fucking go at it, man. I, I, I love this shit. Like he's trying to kill him at every turn. And Robert Carlyle is trying to do him best, like to bring him into his cause. And then when he realizes, oh, fuck that, man, this guy is just not going to be turned. Like they just start fucking killing each other like crazy man damn dude and the blood just flies damn do i love this movie man i just love the survivalistic aspect to it and i love that it was set you know long 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 time ago like you know the colonial times or some shit shit like that where it was like you know obviously you had less means of survival and ideas like the Donner Party, like, you know, obviously of eating somebody to survive. It sounds gruesome. It sounds really like just wickedly evil or something that you wouldn't even imagine doing. But when it comes down to survival, you really will do anything to survive. And it's the God's honest truth, man. Even if you got to eat the motherfucker next to you, <laughs> like, you will do it, dude. Like, my God, man. It's, it sounds it sounds just, uh But, again, man, the whole survivalistic aspect of it, I just really appreciate. And I thought the movie pulled it off perfectly. And the idea that it's directed by a woman is crazy to me as well. The idea that, that this woman could, could go down these dark paths and make something wickedly fun is amazing to me. I love this movie all to hell, man. And like I said, I've been wanting it for a while. And the reason why I haven't pulled the trigger is because I thought somebody else was going to release this at a certain point. I thought maybe Arrow was going to release it or some other company. And I had heard that the Blu-ray from Screen Factory here wasn't exactly the greatest. And so I was like, I was always waiting, like year after year. I was like, oh, there's going to be some other company that's going to announce it. And so I'll just get that at some point. And I kept waiting and waiting 
and waiting. And I'm like, okay, nobody's going to release this shit. So then I was like, okay, I got to get this. And then Orbit, uh, Orbit uh, had some copies, and I was like, okay, great, cool. They've got some copies. I'm going to grab one, man. And I used to have the DVD years ago, and now having the Blu-ray is cool. I'm, I'm finally so happy to have it back in the collection, man. It's got a ton of great commentaries, deleted scenes, you name it. It's got a lot of really great special features on here. The movie is fucking awesome. If you are a gore fan, it supplies you with the gore. If you are a fan of, like, survival movies, this is easily a winner. It, it just has so many great aspects to it with some great memorable characters. And this is a movie, okay, guys? This is a movie that I quote constantly, especially with Bob. Like, we love this movie. And we'll be in a conversation, a random conversation. And one of us, whether it's Bob or me, will will just pop out and say, He was licking me! <laughs> we, just, we just go out of our way to, to say, like, random lines from this fucking movie, man. And it's so good. Oh, God, dude. We, we just love this Liz Flick, man. It's so fun. And to finally have it back in the collection, man, I'm so happy to finally have it, man. Well worth it, man. Well, well worth it. What a great, great, wicked flick, man. Love this movie. Oh, and the pickups this time around, not half bad, man. Not crazy plentiful, but what I got, oh, is definitely well worth all that physical media love. And before I let you guys go, I gotta talk about this because I don't think anybody's really dived into this too much. But I thought it was fascinating, man. So, Christopher Nolan, okay? Christopher Nolan is a very unique and interesting filmmaker. And he's very popular, and he makes popular movies. And apparently he's getting ready to make his next film. Now, he's no longer making it with Warner Brothers. I believe he's making it with Universal. And he has some demands. Some really wild demands. And it was kind of fascinating to learn about all this stuff. So, he wants... He wants a hundred million dollar budget, okay? He wants 20% of the first grosses from the film that go directly into his pocket. He wants a hundred percent creative control. He wants a hundred million dollars for the marketing. He also ends up wanting no films to come out three weeks before his movie comes out and three weeks after. And on top of that, he wants the movie to be in the cinemas only for 100 days. Oh my fucking God, man. Wow, that's some crazy demands of the film, man. I don't know of any director, and I mean any director that would have those type of demands. I mean, even somebody like a James Cameron, who, when he was at the height of his career, would even get those type of demands, man. I, I don't know. My God, man. I mean, I, what if he doesn't get all that? Is he going to walk? I mean, dude. What's fascinating to me about the Christopher Nolan demands is that, is he right in demanding that? I, I mean... If you think about Christopher Nolan, his movies over the years have become more and more popular. You look at Interstellar. You look at Inception. Obviously, the Dark Knight trilogy. We can't forget about that, man. I mean, all that stuff has made money. But if you look at a little bit more deeper into some of his earlier work, maybe not the highest grossing movies ever, but still fascinating films. Obviously, like, Memento and, you know, obviously so some other ones out there. But then again, you look at the last film that he did, and that movie didn't exactly light the world on fire, exactly. I mean, it didn't really make the type of money that they were hoping for. Now, obviously, the excuse is the pandemic, right? The pandemic had closed a lot of things down, Christopher Nolan didn't really want the movie to be on streaming, so he said, hey, look, you know what? We're going to put this in the theaters, and by doing that, 
I think everybody, the the experts, the movie theater owners, was basically putting his movie on a pedestal and basically saying, this movie is the one that's going to get us out of the pandemic. This is the one that's, li that's literally going to erase the coronavirus from everybody's minds and everybody's going to go to the movie theater and it, it's going to be a huge mega hit and open Hollywood back up. I mean, those were crazy high expectations. And clearly, it didn't cross the bar, okay? It didn't. And now, he says, well, look, I, don't, I no longer want to deal with Warner Brothers because of them doing this whole streaming thing, and I don't want my movie to have a day and date, same day release of streaming and in a theater. I want only theatrical release. Okay, he's the filmmaker. He has every right to do that. But the demands, man, I mean, there was a time, there was a time, long, long, long time ago, there was a time, guys, when filmmakers were the auteurs, right? They were the ones that were calling the shots, they were the ones that were, you know, basically, this is a project that I want to do, the studio gives them money, they make it, studio releases it, does pretty well, and they're on to the next project. We are so past those days. We are so past the days of uh, George Lucas or Francis Ford Coppola, Martin Scorsese. We are so f far beyond that, man. I mean, think about this. Looking back, do you seriously think that you could make a movie with a studio like The Godfather? Do you think you could make Apocalypse Now? I don't think so, guys. There is no way that a studio would literally have a filmmaker in the jungles without any communication and literally spending money like it was fucking water and having delays and actor problems and working with a shady government in order to get, like, the helicopters and the machinery and shit. Like, my God, man, there is no fucking way that shit could ever happen again. But the studio had complete and utter confidence in people like Francis Ford Coppola and others in order to trust their vision and knew that they were going to deliver for them. Are we back to that in a, in a certain way? I don't know if we 100% are because you have to remember studios gambled a lot of money on these artists and usually for the most part started to get their money back. But then certain creativity maybe wasn't exactly the way that audiences wanted it to go and the earnings weren't exactly there and studios ended up being more involved in their properties and a lot of the director control the auteur control went away and so now we have started to see a little bit of a turn just a slight turn you see people like Guillermo del Toro Danny Villeneuve you see Christopher Nolan and others out there that are very artistic, that are very creative, that have that style to them, but also a, a big blockbuster style that they can bring to, to a massive audience that can not only appreciate the artistic sense to it, but also the popcorn flavor as well. But again, it's asking a lot of of a studio to really go out of their way to not release a movie three weeks before and three weeks after. So you're literally banking on just that one film alone, that one film to get you through over a month's worth of a release date. That's crazy. On top of that, you also have to understand that asking a studio to not only invest $100 million in your movie, which nowadays is, is pittance because pretty much everyone is spending 200 300 400 million dollars on these properties nowadays but again it's an original idea so you're hoping that the 100 million that you spend is going to be well worth it that's what you hope again there's no guarantee of that all right that's that's another thing on top of spending the 100 million dollar on the movie christopher nolan says you also have to spend a hundred million dollars on the marketing. So that's already 200 million in. All right. Now you have to also remember that 
a movie in order to be profitable for the studio and for movie theaters and every everything all together i think it has to make triple its budget back i'm almost positive on that triple its budget so again it's got to make triple the budget and you're banking on the fact that it's an original work it's not an established property and you're hoping that just on the name of Christopher Nolan alone, it's going to get butts in the seats. That's not an easy proposition to make. Now, it's not that studios haven't gambled on Christopher Nolan before. They have. Warner Brothers gambled on Inception. They gambled on it. But the reason why they gambled on Inception, you have to understand, was because of the Dark Knight trilogy. Basically, Christopher Nolan was like, hey... You know, I scratch your back, you scratch mine, and, you know, it'll be profitable for us. You just got to trust it in, in me. And the studio was like, okay, you made us a lot of money. We're going to trust in you by giving you this pet project that you wanted to do and giving you the budget for it. And it worked out. But that isn't always the way it goes, guys. I'm not going to lie. There's a lot of passion projects out there that these directors have that, whew, man, that goes really by the wayside fast, man, and man, it falls hard, dude. Like, for instance, Richard Kelly, right? Okay, so he does Donnie Darko. Donnie Darko is a decent success, really much beloved by everybody. He has an idea. He says to the studio, okay, trust me, I made you Donnie Darko. I have this project. It's really cool. Support it. Gets Sean William Scott. Gets Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Some other, you know, notable people, Justin Timberlake, and makes Southland Tales. Oh, yes. You remember Southland Tales? I bet you do, man. If you don't, I can't quite blame you. But that movie flopped, and it flopped big time, man. And ever since then, Richard Kelly, dude, has had such a hard time as a director. Now, I don't think Christopher Nolan is going to go down the road of Richard Kelly. I don't think that's going to happen, but you're going to a new studio. You have to understand that he's not again with Warner Brothers. He's with Universal. So Universal says, okay, you did all these movies for Warner Brothers. You made them a lot of money. Obviously, you have this original material. You've been successful with that in the past. But again, what are you what are you offering them essentially, right? Because again, with the Dark Knight stuff, he did, you know, a, some of those movies. Obviously he wanted to do his pet project and then come back to do some, some more Batman. Warner Brothers was like, okay, cool, we'll do that for you. You know, obviously you work with us, we'll, we'll work with you. What does he have to offer Universal that's gonna make them want to take all of these gambles? in order to make one successful Christopher Nolan flick. Are you gonna have a long-term project stuff with Christopher Nolan? Is Christopher Nolan gonna direct, you know, the, the next Fast and the Furious movie? I mean, not gonna lie, I'd actually kinda wanna see that shit. <laughs> but, I, I mean, I mean, this, seriously, that would be pretty damn cool to see Christopher Nolan do a Fast and Furious flick, man. That would be wild, man. But, I don't know, dude. I mean, like I said, studios are gambling more and more and more on their releases. And now that we are in the age of COVID, now that, you know, that that has become a big spotlight on the way that the world is changing, the way that the theatrical movie experience is nowadays is not going to be the same anymore. It's just not, man. And you know, these streaming platforms are very, very big. You know, I talked to you guys about last week how, you know, Halloween Kills is also coming on Peacock and how it's going to be the same day and day as the theatrical release. And honestly, it's going to chew into some of the profits of the theater. It's just going to do it. But they expect that. They understand that. But they have a platform that they want to promote and obviously get subscribers on. And this is a great way to do it. Who's to say that they won't do the same with this movie? Oh, well, it's directed by Christopher Nolan and Christopher Nolan will have all the rights, etc. Et no, it's directed by the, the studio. The studio owns the movie. You have to understand that. Yes, he 
Christopher Nolan is the director, but they're technically directing Christopher Nolan to do this movie because they're giving him the money. They're giving him the money. They're giving him the marketing capabilities. They own the film. And so in a lot of ways, they can do what they want with this film. I mean, yes, obviously they have to do some consulting and some contracts here and there, but they own the film. And so whatever Christopher Nolan says, yes, you want to guarantee a lot of that stuff for a filmmaker that you want to work with in years to come. But at the same time, how much do you count out to, to him and how much do you say, look, we still want a lot of control of this movie. You are trying to guarantee us that this movie is going to be a huge success. But how can you 100% guarantee that any movie is going to be successful? Outside of a franchise thing like a Harry Potter or Star Wars, a lot of these other franchises, you know, the, the Godzilla Kong stuff. I, I mean, outside of some of that stuff, how can you 100% guarantee a studio that they are A, going to make their money back plus more, and you have to give 20% of the grosses to Christopher Nolan. You've got to hand that shit, shit to him. Like, just, just write a check off to him. And on top of that, you are spending $200 million of your own money to hopefully get back triple of that and trust in Nolan to secure you a movie that's going to be a box office behemoth. That's not easy to do, man. There's not many filmmakers out there that can guarantee you that kind of success. Like a James Cameron can, you know, going in and doing Aliens or True Lies, uh, obviously Avatar, Titanic. I mean, that guy can guarantee you that. But there's not many people like that. Even a Guillermo del Toro, who is an extremely artistic and creative human being and somebody who makes fantastic movies, his movies don't even gross crazy amounts of money. I mean, they really don't. I mean, Peter Jackson can at times, but Peter Jackson also hasn't always been the most successful either. Yeah, he may guarantee you a lot of money with, obviously, a Lord of the Rings franchise, but Lovely Bones? Not really. I mean, how much trust is Universal really going to have with Nolan at the end of the day, man? How much faith are they really going to put into this guy? And think about this. If this movie fails... If this movie falls flat on, on its face, which I don't know if it will or not, but let's say if it does, Christopher Nolan's done. I mean, this is a gamble that Nolan is taking as well, because if you don't guarantee all of what he's guaranteeing this, this studio, you give me all of this and I will give you this. If he doesn't deliver on this, then he's done, because how can a studio give him all this money and all these perks and then just hope that people will come along and see it it's not always that simple it's not always that easy and studios really need to balance how much trust they're going to give a filmmaker but how much control they want at the same time you want you want artistic freedom for a director you want that director to flourish and shine and put their own spin on it but at the same time, you also have to look out for your bottom line and for your profits, and you don't want to stray too far from left field. I mean, think about Sam Raimi, for for instance, right? Sam Raimi did the Spider-Man films. And the first Spider-Man, even though it's directed by Sam Raimi, you don't really look at the first Spider-Man movie and say, that's a Sam Raimi movie. It doesn't have a lot of Sam Raimi moments to it. But he had proven himself then when Spider-Man 2 happened, you really felt like that's a Sam Raimi movie, man. It has so many great Sam Raimi flourishes in it, and it feels like it's directed by him. It's not a movie directed by a committee. But then that movie was really successful, so then the producers and the studios and everybody came in and they were like, oh, well, we, we've got to do this now because this is what's going to be, be popular. This is what's going to make it profitable and popular. And not everyone was on the same page, and it turned into a sloppy movie, right? Again, how do you balance creative control and artistic intentions? It's not easy to do, and seeing a filmmaker like Christopher Nolan, who has pulled it off in the past, 
when you're asking for this much perks, when you're asking for this much carte blanche, you better deliver. Because if you don't, man, it could be the end of you in a big bad way, man. But is the studio willing to take that bet? Man, when it's this much money on the line, he has a reputation. But that reputation is only as good as his last film, right? And as much as I kind of enjoyed Tenet to a certain degree, it was sloppy filmmaking. I don't think it was technically his best movie he's ever done. I don't think artistically it's his best movie either. I think plot-wise... I think it was all over the place, and I don't think that he did it in a way that audiences could really connect to the story, and it didn't do as well. And so Hollywood loves the successes, but they remember the failures, and if you're going to promise the world to these studios, and you say, I'm going to promise you this as long as you give me all of this. I love a gamble. I love a filmmaker willing to risk it all. But at certain points, you have to pull it back. As a director, you have to understand your limitations. And Christopher Nolan is somebody that I don't think is quite there yet with understanding his limitations. And I think he's a director that, that wants the world. And in order to do that, you have to pull back the reins a bit and maybe give up some of that control. But it's hard to do that, man. Filmmakers have big egos. They have big egos, and I think sometimes reining in directors is the right thing to do. Sometimes it's not. It's a case-by-case -case basis. Christopher Nolan has earned the right to to ask for certain demands. But again, it's contingent on him delivering for a studio. If you can't do that, then you're you're gambling on $200 million worth of money and you're gambling on the fact that people are going to go see you just because it's word of mouth. I love filmmakers. I love Oliver Stone. I love John Carpenter. Obviously, I love James Cameron and a lot of these other really great directors out there, but none of these people are perfect. None of these people have a perfect 100% track record. And Hollywood is a really fickle bitch. It really is. And so it's like Vegas. If you want to gamble with the house money, that's fine, but just know that when you lose, they're cutting something off, man. <laughs> they're cutting something off. I don't care whether it's a pinky. I don't care whether it's a toe. I don't care what. They're cutting something off, man, and it could just end up being Christopher Nolan's career that gets cut off. It's a gamble. Let's hope the gamble pays off, man. But I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, definitely give it the thumbs up. If you're new to the channel, welcome. Check out the other uh, Blu-ray and DVD out and about videos that I do every single week. Check out the theatrical movie reviews with my friends, live streams, movie hunting like Dollar Tree hunts, and much, much more. If you love movies and physical media, hit subscribe and become a part of the Film Fan Nation. I want to thank you guys so much, man. You guys are amazing. Watching all of the videos and the great comments and the feedback. You guys are amazing, awesome, and I appreciate every single one of you. Thank you so much for the love and support that you've given me. So if you haven't subscribed, definitely do it. Also, hit that notification bell so you'll be notified every single time that I make a video. Also, keep up to date with me through Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Film Fan went away. Keep up to date with everything I'm doing, plus special pictures and videos I do from time to time on social media as well. And... If you want to send the channel any movie-related goodness, posters, physical media, care packages, you name it, you can do that. The P.O. Box is in the description below. 
you guys have asked me to do this P.O. Box. You said, hey, man, we want to send you some cool stuff. Where do we send it? I created the P.O. Box for you guys, and you guys have not disappointed me. You have sent some amazing things my way, stuff that I never thought that I'd get in a million years, and it's all because of you. And I can't thank you enough for the support that you've given the P.O. Box and sending some amazing things my way. Thank you to each and every one of you who have done that, and I can't wait to see where the P.O. Box takes me next. So thank you all. We'll see where those adventures go. But in the meantime, well, another out and about in the books, guys, and more physical media goodness yet to come. So stay tuned for another out and about video experience, and I'll see you back next time, guys. Take care, and remember, happy hunting.